Good evening and welcome to the Milton Select Board meeting for April 14th, 2021. Um, on March 12th, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law to enable public bodies to carry out their responsibilities while adhering to public health recommendations regarding social distancing. The executive order relieves public bodies from the requirement in the open meeting law that meetings be conducted in public places that are open and physically accessible to the public, provided that the public body instead provides an adequate alternative means of public access to the deliberations of the public body. In this case, uh, public access is being provided through Zoom as set forth on the meeting notice for this meeting. And in addition, residents can follow along on television and the information regarding channels on cable TV for Comcast and RCN are on the meeting agenda as well. And this meeting can also be streamed from the MATV streaming website. Thank you. In addition, if you need help um, getting the latest uh, version of Zoom, please call or email the select board office. Thank you. If, uh, if everyone would please join the board for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the, and to the Republic for which, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. <laughs> Thank you very much. And just um, to let people know, we have 11 attendees. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to let people know um, how many people we have in the room since we can't be together and see one another. Um, and right now uh, we're on item number three, which is public comment. So if um, anybody would like to make um, a statement please uh, go down on a, your computer to the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. And if you're using the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. And then when you're recognized, press star six to toggle on and off. And if you could share both your name and your address before you start speaking, that would be very much appreciated. And we have two, two people raise their hands. The first um, is GB. Oh, yes, now you're unmuted. Good evening and thank you very much. My name is Jerry Burke. And I just wanted to take a, a couple of seconds of your time because of the two matters. One, which is a little early, uh, to vo vo voice my opposition to a small and humble bit of open space called Algerine Corner at the intersection of Pleasant and Center Street. Uh, but more importantly, and at this juncture, I um, want to raise a red flag because it appears to me, I hope I'm wrong, that that little protection, that little piece of property has the full protection of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts under Article 97. Now, I know that I sent it all to you uh, in emails, and I know there's a meeting tomorrow night, but the meeting tomorrow night is talking about a plan and what it is they intend to do. I think that we're skipping a beat, so to speak, sort of, sort of in a way, but we'll see what, how that plays out tomorrow night. But the Constitution is very clear and unequivocal in this. In my experience as somebody who drafted a lot of pieces of legislation and dealt with Article 97, I feel that this piece of any change to it is going to require home rule petition and to seek a two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate before any change can occur. And more importantly, uh, no net loss. Um, so there's going to have to be a substitution somehow. Now, 
uh, just for the record, I want to read in uh, just a little portion of what I've already sent you all. The protection of conservation park, agriculture, and water supply land is declared a public purpose in Article 97. Therefore, the disposition of Article 97 land for other purposes should be considered only when other options to avoid Article 97 disposition have been explored and no feasible and substantially equivalent alternatives exist. So I'm respectfully suggesting that somebody pick up the phone, call town council and see if I'm right. And then to monitor this as it goes along. And secondly, I wanna share with you 40 acres of what was Governor Stoughton's woods. I've been in contact with people in the executive office and in the AG's office to review that because I respectfully submit Article 97 was not followed then. And it can be cured, but there's, it is, but there's gonna be a hurdle in how they're gonna deal with the no net loss. Um, and because of past, well, well, I'm just, I'm done. I, I, I feel it's important because the constitution should not be ignored, no matter how small a project is, be it the 40 acres or the, I don't know, maybe 10,000 square feet at Algerine Corner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Um, and next we have um, someone with the phone number, the last three digits are 838. If you could give your name and your address, please. Hi, uh, this is Phil Johanning. My address is 23 Parkwood Drive in Milton. I am um, maybe at um, some point later in the meeting, maybe uh, when you're addressing item 28, um, there could be some explanation that would help me to understand better um, the, the funding of the fire stations. Um, the other night during the debate, um, Mike Zulis at around five minutes, 12 seconds said, we plan to rebuild our fire stations without raising taxes. And I like to hear that, but then there's a debt exclusion on the ballot. So it seems to me inconsistent that we plan to do it without raising taxes, but at the same time, we're asking residents to vote for a debt exclusion, which would exclude debt service for debt related to the fire stations. Uh, we're asking that it be um, uh, exempt from uh, Proposition Two and a Half. So if we don't plan to raise taxes, why are we having debt exclusion on the ballot? So I, I'd just like to understand how these two items could possibly be consistent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joining. And um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do a, um, something with that at, at 28, um, but also feel free to, to, um, to give me a call or an email. Um, it's, a, it's a legal requirement to do that debt exclusion, um, but there, there's a mechanism in place to pay for the debt service. So I'd be happy to go over that with you um, personally, but, um, but, we, but we will do that as well, um, you know, address it. Thank you. Now, would anyone else like to um, speak during citizens speak or public comment? That's what we're calling it now. Um, I don't see anyone else. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, we do have one more hand. Oh, Just we do. One. Okay. Oh, there is. Um, Mr. Hansen. Oh, you're muted, Mr. Hansen. You will, you've put your hand down, so perhaps you don't wish to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Um, okay. Um, 
Item number four. Excuse me, Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. If we might, I, I, if there's no objection, I'd like to move up item 28 just so we can we can respond on the fire station point in real time rather than wait until the end of the meeting. I have no problem it, with that. It, do, do any other members of the board? Um, I'm, I'm going to recuse myself because it relates to borrowing and bonding and my firm would be involved. So I'm going to um, recuse myself while you do the public comment response. Thank you. Mr. Doyle. The question is if Mr. Johanning is still with us as he raised the question. Let's if, Would he be able to hear the responses and discussion? He is still with us. Good. So thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate it. I'm uh, here. Yes. Oh, hello. Um, so um, so there, there's a lot of information on this uh, on the Fire Station Building Committee website. So. Um, that's also a, a good resource. But in 2017, uh, town meeting created, created a special purpose debt stabilization fund. And um, the, as debt service has decreased for the schools and the library, rather than um, lowering taxes, that the delta between the original debt service and, and the, the debt service as it decreased um, is being, it has been placed in, um, in this special purpose debt stabilization fund. And the, the special purpose is uh, to pay for only fire stations or DPW projects. So that's why um, there's not an increase in taxes um, but we'll be able to service the debt through that mechanism. However, that does not absolve us of the statutory requirement to get the debt exclusion. Um, so it's a bit of, um, you know, administrative uh, statutory uh, requirement uh, that we have to go through, even though town meeting and the legislature uh, um, uh, passed legislation for this mechanism. So, um, does that make sense? Yes, Mr. Zulis. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, I, the only thing I would add, just to just to um, maybe flesh it out in full, is is um, as the debt as the debt goes down from the from the library and the um, and the schools, though that the funding uh, from uh, those funds build up this uh, this special purpose fund that was was created in 2017. So as the debt goes down, more and more and more can be used um, for the fire station. So there's no there's no increase in taxes, there's no decrease in taxes, but there's no increase in taxes because though that funding that was was used for the the fire for the library and the schools is now going to be used for the fire stations. Right. And there's no increase in taxes from these projects. So I want to be clear right. on that. <laughs> because that can be confusing as well. Right. Right. Um, so, and this isn't something generally that, you know, if you haven't been a town meeting member, um, it, 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 people might not know, and you haven't been following the fire station building projects for the past five years, um, you, you might not know about it. Um, so uh, uh, I encourage people to go to the fire station building committee um, website. Uh, there's a, a lot of um, webinars and um, public meetings and, and explanations. And, and again, um, if anybody would like to email me, I'm, I'm happy to walk people through it as well. Okay. Um, Item four, COVID-19 update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to continue to thank the health department for their work uh, in helping vaccinate uh, the general public in Milton. Uh, again, a little disheartened that the local vaccination center that was put together at the Council on Aging had to, had to uh, cease. Uh, there was some very good work being done there, but. Last week, the last doses of the vaccine was administered by our health department. So thank you to Caroline and, and all the volunteers and Christine Stanton for making the <laughs> Council on Aging available. Um, we have seen uh, a slight uh, downward trend in the numbers in Milton. Um, we're still hovering there 2%. Um, I'm starting to look at uh, 
again, it's all numbers and science, but I'm starting to look at uh, the number of cases state, statewide. So if you look at the, the last two weeks statewide, there were uh, over 27,000 positive COVID cases uh, in Massachusetts. Um, that's not great. Uh, I think the good news is, is that 63% of those positive cases were people uh, 39 and younger. Um, anyone with the virus is a problem because they can spread the virus to someone else. But um, I think it's promising news that that leads to uh, lower hospitalization rates. Um, but again, the virus is still in our community. Um, people need to be vigilant, uh, vigilant mask up, uh, social distance, and the town will be having uh, another free drive-through COVID test day uh, a week from Sunday, Sunday, August 25th, which is the bookend to the April school vacation. Uh, we ask anyone that has traveled uh, or been with um, people who don't live within their home, uh, get tested. It's open from 10 to three at the public works yard. Again, it's free. It's a drive-through test. You don't have to be a Milton resident. So um, uh, the virus is still in our community. We're hearing nightly on the news about new variants that are coming our way. Um, so I think we still need to continue to be uh, vigilant with, with our, our dedication um, to helping uh, stop the spread. Right. And you, you said it's April 25th? Sunday, April 25th at the right. DPW yard from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do members have any questions uh, for Mr. Dennehy or any comments? Um, we are now at uh, item agenda uh, number five, and uh, that's a discussion with the Asian American Pacific Islander Action Group uh, regarding a walk for peace. And um, with us, we have our own Linda Champion, and, um, <laughs> and uh, she brings with uh, her uh, Mr. Richard Chang and Ms. Betty King, and is there a third um, participant joining us from you your serve as the third? Then, if no one else has logged in, Madam Chair, just wanted to make sure we didn't leave anyone out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Champion. I live at 19 Aberdeen Road. I'm a member of the AAPI um, Action Group. I'm joined today by attorney Richard Chang, who's also the headmaster at the Josiah Quincy, Ele uh, Quincy School, as well as Betty King. Um, I am here, you know, as a Milton resident, but also, you know, my father was a Vietnam War veteran. So I'm the daughter of a veteran um, who actually um, passed away um, due to the effects of Agent Orange on his body. So I would like to think that we're being proactive here, um, getting ahead of things, particularly the climate in the United States with the rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans. Um, but as an American with both Korean ancestry and Black African American ancestry. I just want to make sure that we're all coming together to um, talk about peace and how we can go forward. And this is one of the ideas that we have. So I would like to introduce you to um, Attorney Chang, and he can take over from here. Um, Good evening. I I'm going to defer to actually Betty King, but uh, uh, I'll just uh, say hello. Uh, actually, I'm here not as a lawyer, but as a uh, head of school at the Josiah Quincy Upper School. And I want to thank you in advance uh, for your support, but I'll uh, give the floor to uh, Betty King. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much. Ms. King? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak and to meet all of you. Thank you for reaching out to our community during these difficult and tro troubling times with compassion and empathy. I am Betty Lim King, a commissioner of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Asian American Commission. I am a member of the AAPI Action Group, that is Asian American Pacific Islander Action Group. And I was designated to speak on the group's, on the group's behalf. We are a network of diverse, grassroots leaders and concerned citizens with a commitment to represent our community accurately, 
raise our voices and move our society towards the right direction. We believe that action speaks louder than words. We do not believe in fanning the fumes of hate. We believe that together, as Americans of different descents and heritages, we will and can work together towards the shining city on the hill. Technological advance and digital communications have hindered us to know one another as human beings. The pandemic has made it even more difficult for all of us and there is so much pent up energy and frustrations. We have to start talking to one another, learning, learning about each other's rich and diverse traditions and heritages, relating to one another in an honest way, fairly and equally, not skin deep. By sharing our humanity with each other, we break down all barriers of circumstances of our birth and immutable characteristics which we have no control of, but we have choices and we have in America equal opportunities. Geneticists established that there are more similarities between races and more differences within a race. Love overpowers hate. Let's love one another right now. The 5K race, which was envisioned by Linda Champion, Esquire, and you're all very lucky to have Linda as a Milton resident because she is such a fantastic community leader, authentic, sincere, humble, and uh, has the can-do spirit. So we are, our message in this 5K is love and unity. It aims to not just bring us together to walk or run and be physically fit, but to learn about the diverse Asian cultures and building meaningful relationships with each other across races, ethnicity, gender, economic class, religion, politics, and what have you, all the human distinctions. We actually would like to request uh, that we could actual actualize this event at the end of summer because Linda, has so much goals for us to do, you know? And we feel that we need time to achieve uh, the plan of action that she has in store for us. So on behalf of the Asian American Pacific Islanders Asian group, we thank you in advance for your support and kindness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I'm really, just very touched um, by your message and the theme that you've chosen for your, your run. Um, and you've said that you'd like to do this at the end of summer so we can work on, on a, a date and a course. And uh, typically there's um, a process which is just a, a, a very brief application to, um, that, that we, can, we can help make sure um, gets put together. Um, successfully, but I'd like to invite um, board members to ask any questions or make a comment if you like. Oh, um, Mr. Doyle. Madam Chair, I would just like to um, second your comments and say that um, if uh, my knee holds up, I'll try and walk along. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. Mr. Zoulis. Uh, sure, th uh, thank you. And thank you uh, to Linda and, and uh, Betty and, and uh, Mr. Chang. Um, um, it, it, so, so this is envisioned as a, is this envisioned as a, as a walk or run? And is there anything else that you have planned um, in order to, to drive the message home at this point? Or is that still in process? Yes, yeah, so the, the idea is obviously peace, love, and um, working, you know, coming together as Americans, 
but it's also to give the people who are walking um, some insight into what is Asia. And so oftentimes when people hear Asian or they hear Asian American, their minds can sometimes only think of East Asia. Mm. Um, but Asia is, make, is made up of so many different people, um, so many different um, cultures, heritages. So the idea is that as people are walking along the race, they will get a visual, they will have visual imagery and um, signage where they can also learn about what makes up Asia. And so that they can have a better understanding of um, who people are and what their cultures are. Um, there'll be quotes along the way, whether they're from John Lennon on, you know, what, why we should have peace and peace is a choice. Um, and also um, photos of some of the members and their families. So people can have a more um, robust idea of like who people are when you, when you make fun of somebody, who are you making fun of? Like, so that we can all just reconnect with each other. It's, it's, it's easy to disconnect, um, but we can reconnect if you can put a name with a face and a name with a culture and a name with um, an ancestry. Um, and so, but the, the underlying message is we're all Americans and it's really important at this time, we all have to come together to work together um, to have a, a better future for, for all of us, including our children. Thank you. Ms. Conlon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you all for coming in tonight. It, it might be worthwhile to reach out to the school committee as well and, and help them. They could help you spread the message because it sounds like there's an educational component here too. So that would be something for the students to be thinking about. It's, even though it's the summertime and the school won't be in session, I think the school, the school department could probably help spread the word. That's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, I, I very much appreciate um, the idea of providing people that the connection along the way of the run or, or walk as people are able and choose to do. And um, I think any time that we, we reconnect with, with people who we've othered in some way, um, we, we realize that there's really no separation and that um, we're reconnecting with um, ourselves. And, and so I'm really looking forward to this and um, we can follow up um, later this week and, and um, just so you know, process and, and things like that. Thank you so much, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you all for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good evening. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and now we are on item six, and that's the Milton 360 Tree Initiative with members of uh, the Shade Tree Advisory Committee. And I see Laura Beebe is here and David Corey, hi. Is there anyone else joining you from your, your nope. committee? Thank okay. you. Great. It's Laura and John tonight. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Good. Yes. Hi, John. I'm glad to see he's there. Hello. <laughs> well, well, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us and for bringing um, this proposal. Great. Our pleasure. Good evening, members of the select board. And we thank you for allotting time on tonight's agenda for the Shade Tree Advisory Committee. John and I will be presenting on behalf of the committee. We've had a lot of help on this proposal but we'd like to thank Erica DiDonato, the DPW environmental coordinator in particular for facilitating our appearance here tonight. <clears throat> so as you can see, we have a short slideshow with details of our proposal. This first slide identifies our committee, the Shade Tree Advisory Committee and our mission, thank you. Our mission is to ensure a healthy tree canopy in our beautiful town. Okay, the next slide Sometimes it can seem hard to prioritize trees, but they are naturally slow growing. So we need to plan ahead and think of the future. As this proverb suggests, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Thank you. When we see a street, 
abundant with shade trees on a summer day like Franklin Street and Lantern Lane and these photos. We're reminded how, how important these trees are. So here's our proposal. Am I up? No. Nope. I've, okay, got, go. I've got two more. <laughs> in celebration of the town of Milton's 360th anniversary in 2022, the Shade Tree Advisory Committee will fundraise and with the town's assistance, plant 360 street trees throughout the town. One more slide for me. Thank you. Street trees provide many benefits for people including protection from sun, heat, and rain. They absorb pollution. They buffer pedestrians. They beautify the landscape, increase property values. They calm traffic. They increase businesses or business if it's a treescaped street. Shade trees also screen necessary street features such as utility poles. And they also provide habitat and food for wildlife. All right, and now John will pick up. Thanks. Thank you very much, Laura. So I want to thank Laura. She's um, she's officially on the committee, um, and uh, I'm sort of just the member. And she's sort of taking me under her wing on this project. Uh, I came up with the idea, and I think the whole shade tree advisory committee was um, uh, kind of excited about it. It was a little daring for them, but I think that. Um, uh, they were excited about the proposal and then Laura and I really worked well with Erica from the town to put this together and she helped facilitate a lot of the questions and answers that we had. So I'm just going to go through some of the logistics quickly because I know you have a long night. Um, but we have talked to the town and I think they only have about $10,000 per year for tree planting, which is extremely thin. Um, the good thing is there are some trees at the public works facility. So we have estimated that within a real meager budget, the town can actually plant about 50 trees per year for the next two years. So what we've done is we've allocated uh, 100 trees to be planted by the town towards the 360. Uh, and then we can go to the next slide if you would. And then, so here's the 260 street trees. And we would propose to have donations come from town residents, area businesses, and local foundations. And we kind of modeled it after the 350, the Milton 350 group, and they got a lot of corporate donations and certainly residents came up with $35 or they came up with $2,500. So uh, there was a broad range and we'd sort of tap into that whole, um, to that hopefully that same group that's very civic minded and loves the town. Um, so we come up with some estimates um, we're thinking about two inch caliper trees, which as you can see from this little diagram, they're about 12 to 14 feet. So they're not the small little whips that you see around. You know, it's a good sized tree, a good sized root ball. Uh, it will need water for a year or so, um, but it should within a couple of years really be uh, paying back in spades as the calipers continue to um, increase. Um, so at about $700 per tree, we're including the tree, the water, funds for guarantee. We're including money like a slush fund for town, extra town staff time. Is that something that's, you know, important? We can't keep adding and adding without um, uh, acknowledging their extra time. So we've set a goal of $182,000. And the next, okay. So here, I'm just going to go through very quickly because these are, these will be the questions that we get asked from you folks. So logistics. Um, the staff members will fundraise using the town uh, to facilitate to plant the 260 trees. And our goal is to plant them in the fall of 2021, the spring of 2022, and the fall of 2022 with an event you'll see coming up, an event in the fall of 2022. Uh, and the trees will be planted all along the main streets and the town gateways uh, and the residential areas where more tree canopy is needed. And to take politics out of it, uh, the discussion, um, public works would help us basically be in charge of the locations. And I'll show a slide uh, next. Uh, all tree locations 
would be on town owned property. So once the tree is planted, it becomes the property of the town, like other right of way trees that are planted around. They would get a, the program would offer a gator bag and the town water occasionally, but we'd also do some outreach into the local areas uh, to see if people can fill the gator bags and work out there because they're kind of tricky. Um, the best thing about the program is that it's fully scalable. Depending on how much money we raise, we can plant 60 trees, we can plant 260 trees. And it doesn't matter uh, what level we come in at, although I think we're gonna do really well and get, I think people in the town need something really positive to think about with uh, some of the developments that have been going on that have been not so favorable and then the, the COVID and everything. Um, tree plantings will be done as funds come in. So we don't have to wait until the fall of 2022. As the money comes in, we would start our planting. So people would actually see the trees coming in and maybe get excited about uh, raising more money. Uh, and again, this is when the, uh, they'll be done in three sessions and we check with the town and they do spring and fall planting. Next slide. And this is just actually a snapshot from the town's own tree inventory GIS system, as you can see, and for the public, um, the town actually keeps track of the vacant locations, the planted locations. So from our calculations, there are about uh, 6,000 street tree sites with a 30% vacancy rate. So we actually in the town have about 1800. So we're just, even at 360, it sounds like a lot, but we're just chipping away at a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we would start with corporate donors. We would work off of the list for the 350 to see if they're willing to give um, a few bucks towards the project and we would get, give them their um, name recognition and everything. Next slide. And then we would ask the residents to participate and I think we would probably tackle the, um, you know, some of the staff members and some of the leaders of the community to get them on the list first uh, to get people sort of saying, oh, this is a good project, we should get behind it. Next. Uh, and these are just some possible categories we came up with. We sort of framed them and modeled them after a tree, you know, branch, canopy, grove, woodland and crown sponsor. So we can tweak these amounts, but this is kind of the idea. It's a broad section of the population in um, Milton. And I think it would hit some of the corporate foundations. There are some older people that, you know, love environmental causes. You never know. They could, um, they could hit it in, in a couple of shots. So uh, I have um, high expectations for them. But uh, next slide. Uh, and then recognition. We thought about a couple of things. We wouldn't do too, too much, but we would have certainly uh, a ribbon cutting and then maybe a special donor party, maybe out in front of town hall. And also I've run similar programs in, um, in Beacon Hill where I live too. Um, and um, we've done like plaques and sidewalks or on town hall or city hall. So that could be an option for us as well. And next. And this is one more pick. And I'd just like to call out um, Fred Taylor has done a tremendous amount of work on the Shade Tree Advisory Committee and uh, has done a lot of the work uh, behind the scenes on counting the shade trees and everything. And these are all his photos as well. So I'd like to give a special mention to him that this is what the streets could look like. And that's the end of it. So hopefully, I guess Laura's gonna do maybe some question and answer and um, that's it. Right, so John and I would be very happy to take questions if you have some, and if uh, we can answer them, we will, or if not, we'll write them down and find answers to them. Um, would anyone like to ask a question or make a comment? Mr. Doyle? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Laura and John, for your very, very favorable presentation. I uh, love the initiative, and last night, the Conservation Commission learned of your initiative and would like to extend an invitation to the Shade Tree Advisory Committee to join with the uh, Conservation Commission for the presentation uh, that you just uh, gave the select board along with uh, a related dialogue. I should also mention that the Conservation Commission has a tree bank and we would want to, you probably may be aware of that, we'd like to discuss uh, possibilities that might be available to you through that tree bank. So I just wanted to share that with you and um, you can touch bases with me or with uh, Kathy Bowen uh, in the DPW office to get on the agenda. The next meeting of the CONCOM is going to be on Tuesday, May 11th 
doesn't have to be that meeting. It could be a subsequent one. But the earlier your ore gets in the water, of course, the better off with your planning. So we pass that along to you. And again, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Laura, can I respond to that really quickly? Please. So one of the things is that we won't be able to probably plant all native trees, but on our list, we certainly have the majority would be uh, native trees. So hopefully that will be, um, you know, we can't guarantee it because, you know, things change or whatever, or different circumstances, but certainly that would be um, our preference. So what's the pro what what what's the prohibition or what's the what's the difficulty with choosing all native trees? Well, primarily we primarily we actually uh, if you remember, there's actually a list uh, that was developed by the Shade Tree Advisory Committee in conjunction with lots of experts. And our list is native trees. But what's starting to happen is climate change. And so the list is actually shifting a little bit. So some southern trees are coming our way because they are resilient. Uh, they can handle hotter temperatures, they can handle drought. So for the most part, I'm certain we would be looking at, at native trees and we do have a nice list. And of course the list also uh, comprises different sizes because obviously there are tall trees, there are medium sized trees and sometimes we also are looking at smaller ones, so. Right, right. okay. So, so that's interesting. I, I think of the sassafras and that's a Southern, well, it, it had been up here and then it was Southern and now it's, it's come back. Um, but that's still, I consider that still a native tree, if not mm -hmm. something that we're familiar with as indigenous, sorry for all the tree talk um, fellow board <laughs> members, but, but, um, but so we're not talking about planting ginkgos. What we're talking about is, is um, looking at the, the shifting um, yeah, climate patterns and, and adjusting with those. Okay, I understand now, thank you. Um, that's great. Does anyone else have a comment or a question? Just a thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a great committee, it has been since they were formed and a lot of people put in a lot of effort, including Fred Taylor with in the survey that he did going out through, throughout town to in the hot weather in the summers to keep track of where the trees are missing. So, um, and I'm sure Peggy Chow, your former chair is, is uh, cheering you on, but this this is an ambitious goal, but it's uh, it's great to see it. And I hope you're very successful and and that you have many donors and sponsors. It's, it's really wonderful to set this as a goal for the 360th. So thank you for all of your efforts. Excellent. Mr. Dennehy, oops. Uh, Mr. Zulis was first. Okay, Mr. Zulis. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think this is tremendous. Um, I love the idea of it being privately funded. Um, uh, however, um, with the American Rescue Plan and if there's an infrastructure plan, there may be a possibility, you know, that may fit in one of the categories. Uh, so we can keep our eyes out for that um, as uh, as that federal, if if and when that federal money is uh, is coming our way. So I think it's great. I think it's a great uh, great initiative. Yeah, what I was just going to say is uh, one of our things is that you know, if the tree roughly is seven hundred dollars per year uh, per um, to install. I mean, that tree is seven hundred. I mean, what better place to invest the money because next year it's worth a thousand. And the year after that, it's worth 1500 And then it's worth 2000 And then when it's six or seven calipers, I mean, it's worth, it just, it, it gives back so many times for a one, one donation. So, but that's it. We're also keeping our eyes open for grants, grant possibilities. We've actually gotten a couple of leads on possibilities there. So that would be another way to bring in some money too. Okay, that's great. Mr. Dennehy? I, uh, I echo the board's thoughts and I want to thank Laura and John specifically, but everyone on the Shade Tree Advisory uh, Committee and their work with Alan Bishop to develop the GIS mapping, which has gone a long way as uh, Mr. Corey presented tonight. Um, and, and everyone on the Shade Tree Advisory Committee, past and present, um, want to give a shout out to Erica DiDonato, who's on the call tonight, um, who's also been working with them. And just know that uh, let the Shade Tree Advisory Committee know that they'll have full support of the town in the, in the planting efforts. So Thank you. certainly willing to help. Thank you. Yes, I can't, I can't uh, think of, of a, better, a better way to mark our 360th 
anniversary. And it's apropos because it's the month for uh, Earth Day and although every day should be Earth Day and and Arbor Day too uh, on the 30th, so. And actually today, technically, they, I don't know if they come up with these holidays all the time, but today is technically National Gardener's Day or National Gardening Day, but. It is. Um, and then the last thing I would just say is that the Milton, Hilton, Milton Times is listening and if they wanna write a story, they are very welcome. And Laura and I will be happy to give quotes. Great. Well, th thank you both. Th thank you, your committee too, um, as everyone said, for, for the tremendous work. And um, we'll- Madam Chair, I see Tucker Smith's hand is raised. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hi, good evening. Yes, this is Tucker Smith speaking, uh, resident at 1632 Canton Avenue. Uh, former, I'm a former shady, uh, well, I, I don't know what retired shade tree advisory people Emeritus. are. <laughs> Emerita. Um, uh, but I would like to thank uh, Laura, John, and, and all of, of Stack. Um, one thing uh, I'm putting on my sustainable Milton hat, um, of which I'm president, and one of the, the benefits that was not in the list is the fact that um, tree planting uh, is a significant nature-based solution for, it's not the solution, excuse me, for climate change, but it is a, a very important tool in the uh, mitigation of, of climate change um, because of trees' ability to sequester carbon um, from the atmosphere. So, um, you know, it's not a, a real estate thing, it's, it's a planet thing. And um, I just, I think it's terrific. And I just want to add that to the, to the long list of benefits um, and to thank everyone. So um, I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. I think you'll like our proclamation for Earth Day then. Um, thank you so much for, for, um, for reminding us of that, Tucker. Well, uh, we really appreciate your joining us and, um, and, and good luck, we'll be here to support you. Can I just make sure that means that we have essentially your blessing to move forward and to engage like with an official council? vote? I, 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 I think I, that we're all in agreement, okay. but, uh, but if, you, if you'd like an official vote, we could, we could do that. Um, that's up to you and your protocol, but just wanted to make sure that we could well, move, why don't, move ahead. Why don't we do that and we'll, we'll, we'll make it official. Would the, someone like to make a motion or shall I? Mr. Doyle? Madam Chair, I'll move that the select board endorse the uh, Shade Tree Committee Initiative 360. Second. Excellent, thank you. All those in favor, uh, Ms. Conlon? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zoulis? Yes. Ms. Conlon, yes. Okay, thank you, have a good night. Thank you, have thank a great you. evening. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Presentation. Excellent. Okay, great. Um, item number seven: a discussion report uh, with our municipal. Excuse me, municipal broadband committee. I need more water. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Mr. Zulis is on the broadband committee, and we have Mr. Day and Mr. Lynch. Um, so. You have a presentation, I believe, for us. Is that correct? Yes, we do, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your time and, and for your dedication to the town. Um, so uh, as you know, the, uh, the committee has been evaluating, uh, replacing the, um, the town's INET institutional broadband network and um, has been, is now also evaluating um, using the potential to use the INET as a backbone for expanding broadband service to residential and business customers um, in the town of Milton. Um, next slide, please. The, the first, so we've identified or we've created a roadmap for ourselves. And the first step in this process we have, done, have identified is to the creation of a so-called MLP, a municipal light plant. Um, municipal light plant would, is just a statutory entity designed to, um, become the owner of this infrastructure plan. Um, there's no cost up front for creating this, this entity. Um, there's no funding sources, no obligations created, um, simply just a shell uh, to begin the process. Um, the committee's moving with some urgency on um, creating the 
MLP and getting this first vote out um, for, for two reasons. The first is that the creation of an MLP is a, a two vote process. So it would have to be approved at a town meeting once, hopefully at this upcoming town meeting, and then again at a subsequent meeting. Um, the other, uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's our, here's our roadmap here of, of our steps that we've identified, um, the, the MLP votes, which I mentioned. Um, but the, the second source for our urgency is um, the potential sources of federal funding that um, we've been um, digging into a little bit on the committee level. Um, one is the, um, the American Recovery Plan, um, of which $8 billion has been allocated to Massachusetts, $3.5 billion for local uh, municipalities like this town. Um, and in, this, in that bill, there's, uh, sorry, excuse me, this legislation, um, there's specific allowance for broadband infrastructure. Um, we've also have been watching the um, the American Jobs Plan, which is the known better as the $2 trillion infrastructure bill. Um, that bill also specifically, at least in this iteration, um, is potentially $100 billion for broadband internet um, infrastructure. So there's, so we've identified some potential sources of funding um, that could make a real difference for a project like this. And obviously, um, I guess it goes without saying that Every, every town and city in, in the state is probably looking to find ways that they can make use of these funds. So the, the ones who act first and act decisively are the ones that are probably gonna come out on top um, with, a, with a good source of funding for these plans. So what our, our goal is, and it, and it may be ambitious, is to have our plans uh, shovel ready by the fall town meeting. And by shovel ready, we mean um, a fully fledged business plan laid out um, that will um, identify um, sources of funding um, and an action plan for creating this um, broadband network. The, um, the business plan will likely contemplate the federal funding that I mentioned and also as a, as a fallback um, conventional um, institutional financing and um, the maintenance and ongoing um, operations of the, of the internet broadband um, will be most likely covered through um, service uh, subscriptions. So we would have residents and businesses be subscribers to the, the broadband network. Um, the town itself could control the pricing. And so there would, there would be potential opportunities for income-based pricing or other equitable uh, solutions for town members. Um, we also, in the business plan, will likely be exploring um, opportunities to partner with other um, towns and cities, our, our neighbors, um, some of which like Braintree and Norwood have already adopted uh, municipal broadband and um, others like Quincy, which are, have been making big progress towards um, creating municipal broadband, as well as other towns like Weymouth that are, um, in, are getting into the, the, the study of, of adopting it. So we see a lot of opportunities to, um, to partner with them and to you know, share expenses and um, um, share the burden a little bit on, on developing these, these projects. Uh, but we certainly see it as something that um, we need to act quickly and act decisively on because um, we believe that the, town, the towns that act quickly will be the winners and uh, they'll be winners for a long time because we see this as a very important uh, investment in the town. Um, internet demand is, is, is in increasing exponentially and we see you know, fiber optic broadband as a source of um, you know, exponentially better speeds and capacity um, that at this point are really limited by the hardware that, that people use and that can be updated over time. So we really think we have um, an opportunity to use this funding to set up the town um, to meet these new and increasing demand, internet access demands um, for a number of years in the future. Um, and that's why um, we're moving to have the, uh, the first vote with the MLP um, to have that pass to uh, set up that that first step um, in this very important goal. So we, so we appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. We, we appreciate the committee's time. Um, 
do members have questions or comments? Mr. Zulis? Madam Chair, I, I just want to ask uh, Mr. Day if he has, has anything to add uh, to what Rob said. Uh, no, I'm just here to provide moral support. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's well taken. And, and, and I, I'll just elaborate on one, one point that, that Rob mentioned, and that is that, you know, I think, you know, my view is, and I think it's the committee's, most of the committee's view, that enhanced broadband infrastructure is, is a key for any community's future for the next you know, uh, uh, 30 to 50 years. And those communities that have a better uh, uh, and enhanced broadband infrastructure are gonna have, uh, they're gonna have enhanced public safety communications. They're gonna have more opportunities for jobs and a remote working environment, more opportunities for jobs uh, for, uh, for the residents. And it's gonna be increasingly used by the schools as well. So this is, a, is an infrastructure that I think is important for all of those things, for public safety, for jobs and for the schools. And I think if we can take advantage of the, the funding that may be available uh, over, the next, uh, over the next short period of time, then we can get a leg up. We're, 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 we're moving along, we, we may be um, a little bit ahead, a little bit ahead because we, we've started on this and we've, We've, we've got some of the pieces in place now, but, uh, but as Rob mentioned, I think there's a real, um, there's a real energy on the committee about, about moving, uh, moving more quickly uh, to see where we're gonna end up with this. Mr. Doyle. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and gentlemen for your presentation um, and a nod to Mike for his support and leadership in this area as well. Uh, this, from my perspective, this is extremely important. And I just had uh, two questions or one question with two parts. And that is, um, is there a monitoring of uh, related initiatives and resources at the state level? And then will there be a monitoring of a possible uh, resource availability and integration into what might become a national initiative through the proposed infrastructure uh, legislation that we'll be seeing in the not too distant future. Whether it's passed or not, it would be good to know if there's a, a, a tie in to what's evolving and developing, even if ideas can be borrowed from it, brought back in. Sure. So. Um... So what we know at this point is that with the American Recovery Plan, there's money specifically allocated to the towns. Um, so that 3.5 billion number that I that I mentioned in Massachusetts, so towns and cities in Mass. So I don't. So we the committee doesn't know yet. Um, we need to explore more of what how the state money can be, how that's going to be allocated between the the towns and cities, the ones that that's not specifically allocated to them. Um, and then with the the federal funding from the um, the American Jobs Plan, uh, we've not yet investigated um, how, and I don't know if that mechanism's even been set up yet of how the funding would be would be allocated um, between the states and between the municipalities. Right. You, you just led to where I was going next in the relationship between the state and the federal possibilities, and then how that would fit with the town's planning. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm on the committee for finding that money. So yes. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think right. we'll, we'll, we'll overlook it if it's to be found, but yeah. there's not a lot of detail yet. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. The, the Mass Municipal Association is having uh, sort of the next dive. It seems like we're getting this information in increments. So um, every time there's information, uh, you know, we, we get invited to new webinars. And um, so there's one, I think it's next week. I can't remember what day. And I noted that broadband was was in that too, and will undoubtedly be in the jobs. I the, the jobs um, act. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think I've already been reading about that. So so we'll try to help you monitor for that. Um, and uh, but you're right. the The information is is slim at the moment, um, and that there is a big question about like you know, the money that goes directly to the state, what will the, they allocate that for and to whom will it be allocated? Because I think many times, um, you know, people think of the Western part of the state as needing a lot more help with broadband. And actually in a lot of cases that, that's true because there is not service in those areas. Um, so we'll have to see what the state 
does with that. And, and, and I think the federal government too, there's been a real push in rural areas and on, um, and on reservations. Um, so we'll keep an eye out. We'll, we'll try to help you there. And, Ms. and to that point, the county is also getting a lot of money under the, the American recovery plan. So I think that's another source of funding to keep an eye on. Right, and and it, I I don't know. It might be a good idea just to reach out to um, our our county commissioners and just mention to them that this that's one of the interests that we have because, um, as someone was saying uh, in in another meeting that that we had, you know, our relationship to our counties is a little different than in some areas of the country where the county. Per, uh, provides lots of services that we actually provide on, on a local municipal basis. So, um. yes, that's very important. As they said in parts of the country where I work, the counties are king. Right. Okay. And, and, and just to add one more thing, uh, we're not on our own on this. Uh, you know, Weymouth is interested in it. Braintree already has it because they have a, a, a traditionally had a light department, traditionally had a light department. And so they, 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 they bolted broadband onto that. Quincy is moving forward on this under the leadership of Councilor Kane. Um, uh, Norwood traditionally has a light plant, Concord. So there are, there are uh, municipalities that are moving forward on this. Um, you know, we we've started. We've we've got some pieces in place, um, but uh, but if we move forward on this, uh, it'll be it'll be to the benefit. The first step, as as Rob pointed out, is we need to pass. Um, well, I can't really argue for, it, but we need we're, we're going to be considering the article uh, for the uh, the municipal light plant uh, at town meeting. That will be the first step, uh, and then and then we'll go after that. So, Mr. Doyle. Madam Chair, on Mike's point, has there been consideration of a collaborative initiative? Um, several communities um, wetting themselves in putting forward uh, funding proposals, et cetera, because there may be um, more leverage with that type of an approach and a considerable adjustment uh, that would surface the uh, socioeconomic uh, benefits by aggregating those across the related communities. And there would be economies of scale if you took all of those communities, Mike, that you were talking about and put them into a, uh, a, a joint initiative. So, so it's interesting you mentioned that, Arthur, because just uh, the other day, uh, we were talking about perhaps getting together and, and convening a meeting with um, Quincy and Weymouth and Hingham and Braintree and, and seeing if our joint efforts uh, can move us along faster. And so we're, we're you know, we, we, we were throwing around the idea of maybe reaching out and trying to have a, a, a joint um, across community meeting sometime in the summer. Okay. Well, um, thank you again for, for, uh, for your continued work on this and uh, it's exciting. Um, and we look forward to uh, to town meeting and getting to this article. Okay, thank you all for your time. Oh, thank thank you, all. you. Actually, I think Mr. Dennehy has something he'd like to oh, share. Sorry. Mr. Dennehy? <laughs> yeah, Ma Madam Chair, the Norfolk County Commission is our, our meeting now as we speak. It's not on their agenda, uh, but Milton stands, stands to see $5.5 million from the American Rescue Plan Act. And I uh, have had conversations with uh, Commissioner Shea. Uh, they're still in the process of figuring out how to disseminate that money. Uh, if you recall, during the first round of, of COVID money that came um, the state's way, only Boston and Plymouth County received it as a lump sum as they qualified with more than 500,000 uh, population. So this is new to the Norfolk County commissioners, but they're working through the process. It's not on their agenda tonight, but I, I anticipate it will be on their next agenda. So we're following that closely and it's, it's approximately uh, $5.5 million that, that Milton stands to, to share. Thank you, Mr. Dennehy. Thank you again, Mr. Lynch and Mr. Day for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item number eight. Uh, Mr. Doherty should be joining us. Um, that's a, a runway for our update and process approval follow-up actions. 
Hello, Mr. Doherty. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes. So I want to uh, update uh, the board on the uh, meeting that occurred of the MCAC April 8th, last Thursday. And I'll say to start with that I think we're at a key moment now as it relates to the FAA and, and uh, Massport and MIT uh, study as uh, concerning the uh, potential dispersion of uh, flights paths. Uh, in a word, uh, last week, MIT presented its sort of preliminary final recommendations uh, as they relate to all of the paths, including 33L, which I'll actually touch upon, 27, these are departure paths, which I'll touch upon, and 4R. And um, I would say that it's clear, and uh, there's a link to that entire presentation, which I'll mention. I think it's clear that um, FAA narrowed uh, disappointingly, it's uh, uh, recommended, uh, you know, proposed recommended option for 4R uh, following the, uh, at least chronologically, following the objections of Quincy, Braintree, and Hingham that were uh, raised uh, in basically uh, one line. Um, memos or letters to the MCAC noting their objection, notwithstanding that the MIT and we uh, and others have worked for years on uh, the matters and only after uh, those had already been proposed. So I'll go through it, but we're at an important moment. As that was uh, upcoming, one of the things that uh, was clear was that MIT was gonna be making presentations and with respect, for example, to 33L, you may remember that all of the proposals that had been worked upon with, by MIT on 33L departures, that's Cambridge, oh, departures that go over Cambridge, Arlington, Medford, Malden, Chelsea, Somerville. Uh, last fall, uh, FAA rejected all of those. And so, uh, Congresswoman Clark asked that MIT go back to the drawing board and re reassess those. The first time that the 33L uh, communities saw the output of that was at this uh, April 8th meeting. So going into the meeting, uh, I asked that the meeting be split up between presentation and uh, any motion or action to be taken uh, in light of the fact that people need to absorb the, the information and, and not, not only 4R, but 33L, it wasn't getting the information in advance. I had asked last fall that we get altitude information with regard to those uh, alternative paths. And we did get that slightly before the meeting and I'll come to that. And that request was honored and the executive committee acted to split the meeting up into presentation on April 8th, and there will be potential resolution on June 10th. So there are uh, a couple of months, therefore, a little less than that now, to address all of this. So let me, um, with that as a prelude, see if I can put up, I'll put up, there were more than 60 slides presented on the various matters. And I'll put up 10 because I want to touch on 33L and 27 as counterexamples to what uh, 4R is, 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 is uh, involved with. So let me see if I can, whoop, hold on. Okay, so. And you see, uh, it says 33L dispersion. Do you see that slide? Yes. 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 Okay. So let, let me. This is the this is this is the key slide that was presented by MIT on 33L dispersion. The most important thing that uh, you need to read from this initially, anyway, is what's the objective? The objective on the departures, and there's Logan Airport down there and there in red is the existing set of 33L departure paths, north and out 
toward Europe and West and South. And here are, th here are in green are the recommended procedures. Most important thing is first, MIT's statement, which we would agree with, obje objective, increase equity by dispersing the flight tracks. So after the uh, rejection of all the prior alternatives last fall, and after Congresswoman Clark's uh, reiteration that something needs to happen with regard to dispersion, this is the recommended procedure, this one in green. And uh, it's recommended as a dispersion, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through it briefly, but it's not recommended as an alternative. In other words, it's not as if sometimes the red path will be followed and other times the green. It's, it's a singular uh, dispersion effort and it does have benefit. It, it doesn't have the benefit it might have had had there been some rotation because what happens is of course uh, communities affected before in red uh, will be affected differently as, as well as communities in, in green, if you're with me. So then let's go further here. This is MIT's way of showing the noise impact differential between what is existing now and what would happen if, if that green set of paths were, were pursued. And so it's an increase in noise effect. So change in number above 60. So 60 decibel levels by day and 50 by night is uh, per, per moment, per, per flight uh, overflight. Let me stop there. You may remember that FAA itself dilutes noise effect by taking the entire year and uh, then looking at the entire days within the year and uh, uh, computing noise effect over the entire year at 65 decibels or above, even if you know you're on the ski slope uh, in the summer and no one's there, and yet you're measuring congestion. I've said this a thousand times. MIT doesn't use that, didn't use it at all. It, it has its own accepted uh, better methodology. So if there are, for example, going to be, and look at Somerville, more than a hundred, up into a hundred, 150 more flights per day in peak days, not, not in the summer when it's no skiing, but when there are peak days, and the level of the uh, noise will be above 60 decibel levels, it'll come out in red under this uh, alternative, under this proposal. On the other hand, um, if the change will benefit in terms of less noise, and you'll see, this is, this is in here, you'll see uh, Medford, for example, and I'll come to that. Uh, there'll be 150 fewer flights or more than that, depending on how deep the blue is, light blue to deep blue. Uh, flights with noise below that 60, uh, well, at or above the 60 decibel level, but, but about 150 fewer or 200 fewer flights. Similarly, if you get over to Stoneham, Stoneham over to Arlington, uh, down into Cambridge, Cambridge is the gray means there's not a lot of difference in some areas, and then there's some, some let, you know, some increase in others. I think, I think you get the point. But the big issue for us is that this is a modality that would create dispersion. It's not used alternatively, which I think is subject to some criticism because there's no rotation between this and the other, but it does have some benefit. And if I can just go a moment there, do you see this number 16952? So uh, it also increases the total number of people who are affected by the uh, measured noise. So it's not a situation where there are fewer people affected, but the dispersion is such that yes, there are more people affected, but the, but the, but the effect is dispersed, if, you, if you're with me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's fundamental. So uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the folks under 33L had not seen it before the meeting, they've seen it now, and based on the protocol that was agreed at the executive committee, they're gonna have until June, on June uh, 10th, to consult about that and think about it, but at least potentially it has some uh, dispersive impact, and, and there'll be discussion about how does that compare 
with the way things were before RNAV. One of the criticisms of the MIT presentation is there isn't a slide that shows the, the, the overall before. I, I, I'm going to expect that uh, some of those communities will be asking for that in the in, in coming, uh, upcoming uh, weeks. So now go to the next. And this is how they, they sort of presented it. Here you'll see, um, and I go back one step. Yeah, so this one is Somerville. Each, each community or each municipality then, I know it's a small slide and I took a, uh, a, 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 a shot, a camera shot of it. But this will show you that within Somerville, there's gonna be a hundred or more uh, flights at a high decibel level or high, high enough decibel level to be recorded uh, more than they were before. And then in another part, uh, fewer, that's Somerville. On the other hand, uh, this one, again, it's my snapshot. You'll see uh, in, in Medford, there's, there's uh, some significant decrease in the number of uh, flights at, at a decibel level. So they did break out, although it's not pre RNAV to now, it's now versus this change, how the dispersion would affect. And, and that, that was helpful in that regard. Now I'll switch over to runway 27. Runway 27, here's Logan again, goes out from Logan, it goes over south end of Boston, it goes out to, toward Franklin Park out here, it goes over Roslindale, Hyde Park. And you may remember, this is uh, 2021 now, back in uh, 2019, when I went on the MCAC, one of the things I wanted to avoid with regard to 27 in any change is, here's the red, this is, this is you know, existing 27. And uh, if there's gonna be a change, we, you know, we did not want the change to be one where uh, Milton and Mattapan would be subjected to a, uh, a further impact. And in fact, that worked by getting a seat at that table and working uh, on that. The, the proposed change is in green, the red is existing, and that's gonna go out uh, further before turning south toward Dedham. And you'll see the touch, see here's Milton here. And so that, that would be a change. Um, again, what is the objective? It's an agreeable one. Increase the equity by dispersing flight tracks. It's, it's not alternation, but it is uh, quite a bit of broadening. For example, and I, I don't think I have it on here, but you can look. There's a link on the Massport Community Advisory Committee website, which is also referenced on the Town of Milton website. There, the, the Massport Community Advisory Committee website has the link to all 60 slides. And you can look at that and there, are, there is a breakdown that will show you that, for example, Brookline, which is not at all touched by the existing path, is, uh, is uh, uh, going to have flights over it with regard to the, uh, this, this new path, this proposed path. So that's the dispersion. Now we come to 4R. So with regard to 4R, if you notice what MIT has done, and I view this as a backtracking, uh, its objective is to reduce the exposure to highly impacted communities. Well, wait a minute. Um, if you're looking at before RNAV and now, uh, what we are asking for is the equitable distribution of the overflight burden. And in many respects, that's a restoration um, with regard to uh, impact uh, because we, without consent, were impacted. And uh, it's not about reducing the exposure to highly impacted communities if that means further concentrating over uh, Milton and um, not recognizing that there's a need to also share over those other communities who previously uh, shared the burden. Now, it, that, that, so that itself is like an initial signal. And then, yes, they're discussing the, the two kinds of paths we've talked before, and I'm gonna to come to them again in a minute. That's the, that's the RNAV path, which is the, the sky rail in the sky. And then there's the RNP type of uh, path, which is the required navigational performance. About 65% of uh, major aircraft have that now, and they can have turns that the, RN, the, that the RNAV path 
uh, straight in procedure doesn't really have. And uh, those are a, those have been, and we, as we discussed last September, October, November, in, in uh, presentations to uh, you, you all, uh, those are potential avenues. Uh, so far, so good. Then uh, what they did is to say, look, we're actually going to recommend this small change here, which uh, essentially uh, has about uh, 214 fewer people affected and is a slight variation coming in, uh, although actually it's going to uh, affect uh, more of that, I'll call it the northern part of about, just above East Milton. In other words, I'd say Squanum Street and, and above. Uh, not that it's um, anything we've ever advocated. It's uh, simply something that they've uh, themselves uh, uh, put forward on the ground that it has a lowest population exposure and doesn't have the complexity of the RNP uh, uh, tracts. Now you'll remember last uh, fall when they presented those RNP tracts, they said they were quote, flyable. They said they would have to be tested under the uh, FAA air traffic control procedure, but they, did, but they mentioned that repeatedly that they were flyable and labeled them so. But this is therefore their first and essentially uh, major uh, recommendation. Let's go forward. Uh, you'll remember uh, this path here, and this is essentially coming from the south and then merging in. It is an RNAV path. Uh, it does affect more people, 50, 5,800 people. And um, th th their, their concern is it, it has some uh, so-called merging where the two paths have to come together and the planes have to be sequenced. It has, it has merging uh, consequences. It's, it, it's not been an alternative that we favored, but uh, notwithstanding that, that's also one in which because of the so-called merging uh, assertion or merging concern, uh, they are not uh, favoring. I'll come, I'll come back to the merging issue in, in just a moment. The next is familiar. This is uh, the RNP path, the curving path. And in this case, it comes in over uh, Howe's neck, turns over the water and comes forward. This is what they presented last uh, to me last July, to us all last September, to the MCAC last October and among others, I'll show you the Hingham one in a minute. Uh, and there are 7,126 fewer people affected. It also involves Quincy in the uh, mix where Quincy, as I'll show you later, previously had uh, flights over them that they don't have now. And what it also talks about is community support unclear. This is, la this is last Thursday. Uh, following the objection that was uh, uh, presented by letter from Quincy. It, then they said there are some potential airline concerns about the short final approach. Uh, I'll say it now, but I'll say it further when we get to merging. Uh, that approach is identical to those used at, uh, you know, Reagan National, uh, uh, Houston, Atlanta, uh, Chicago. It isn't, it isn't uh, unique. It's something that can be, I think, considered. And then it says air traffic control concerns with merging uh, with straight in flight tracks. So that's the mer mer merger there. And, the, and the, con the concern is planes coming in on the flight track straight in have to be sure that they're gonna come in behind those coming before them and vice versa, right? That's been there before. And I have said more in the last uh, 60 seconds about that than they said uh, uh, on April 8th, I believe fairly. W what we need to do is to um, raise with them uh, the fact that when RNP technology was being developed, this merging question was one of the very first questions that was addressed. And uh, there are both merging technology um, evaluations, 
by MITRE Corporation and others uh, about the technology that's used. It's called RPI, Relative Position Indicator uh, Technology. There's also another uh, way to think about it, this merging. Some of you will remember that when in 2017, the um, runway 4R was being repaired. So in March of 2017, the FAA issued what's called a CADEX, a categorical exclusion saying, look, there won't be any problem if we proceed uh, while the runway of 4R is being repaired or extended and uh, repaired actually. What we'll do is planes will come in on 4R until they get to within a, a few nautical miles of the, of, the, of the touchdown and they will sidestep and they will land on 4L. So the 4L was used as a sidestep procedure that allowed 4R to be um, repaired. But if you think about it, these planes on this uh, track here, the RNP track could land on 4R and the planes coming in on 4R uh, uh, path could be at some nautical mile uh, distance sidestepped or they could otherwise be uh, 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 projected in an air traffic control uh, to land on 4L anyway, subject to some governance. In any event, none of that uh, has been evaluated and all of that needs to be. And uh, yet this was presented for the first time on April 8th um, without any of that uh, analysis. So that's something I think we need to um, address. Here is the Hingham version. And, you know, it's just astonishing. Yes, it's true uh, that, you know, the, 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 before RNAV, the planes that were coming in on 4R were predominantly in this area here, not as far over as Hingham. But the planes coming in over Hingham here, uh, should they do that, would affect 20,550 fewer people. And uh, you think about that, that's the difference between 32,000 and 11,000, almost a third. In addition, what I did last fall is I said, could you please tell us the altitudes? Because that's going to matter in terms of the noise, right? Because the noise is exponential. If you're, if you're at twice the altitude, you, you, you could be, you know, almost four times uh, the noisier. If you're at half that altitude, it's, it's, it's four, time noisier, four times noisier than something that's double the altitude. Well, they did give us that, and I, I think I'll have that in a second. Uh, let me go to that. Hold on. Um, yeah, let's see if I can do this. Oh yeah. There, are you still with me? Yes, and we can see the new slide. Okay, thank you. So here, what I did, yes. So what I did here is to say, take us through what the altitude differences are. We'll start with the simple one, which is the one that isn't necessarily as helpful to us as some of the RNP ones, but what are the altitude differences? And you'll see that with regard to this one, they're not very significant. Uh, and um, yes, more people are affected, but on the other hand, uh, as we'll see in a later slide, uh, Quincy, uh, Quincy previously before RNAV uh, was affected and they'll be, they would be affected again uh, at approximately the same, but not you know, approximately the same. Uh, manner. Now we go to this slide where the approach is over house neck and then turning there. I think this is touching a little bit on um, Marina Bay, but all over the water and fewer people. And here's the altitude set up here. And so a lot of this, you know, is um, over water without any impact on people and at some pretty high altitudes compared to some altitudes here. 
it's it's not as great as you'll see in a moment with regard to Hingham, but there is a differential uh, in terms of a, a lesser noise impact. And our point here was it's not that this or any other RNP path needs to be used in substitution for this path, but rather in some degree in alternation, such that on one day this is used and on other days this is used, the green. In other words, uh, some, some governance that simply says we're gonna, as they do at Heathrow Airport, we're gonna uh, alternate the, the use. And this is really, uh, here's Hingham, and you'll see this is a rather significant because at 3,000 feet and then over the water, that's a lot different from way back here where it's 3,000 feet and then down you know, to 1592, 1274, et cetera, 11, 11, even here, 11, uh, 1911 uh, versus you know, that 3,000 and here is, is, is a huge uh, difference. And again, the idea would be to use it in alternation. None of this was presented. Yes, thank you very much, MIT, for giving us the information, but they didn't present it at the MCAC meeting because they were focused on just that one simple path. Um, let's see. That, again, this is, this is very similar to the one that they're talking about. Uh, recommending, and the altitudes aren't that different. Uh, so the three paths that we were looking on and looking at ourselves, you know, included this one and this one, uh, uh, particularly. And now let me go, I'm almost done to my next piece here. I asked uh, Massport last fall to go back to 2000, let me see if it shows it, 2009, here we go. And provide a visual of the contours of the flights over Quincy uh, and over Milton and landing on 4R and 4L to show the dispersion uh, visually. Uh, and I think you may have seen this before as a way of kind of indicating that, look, what we're asking for is something that's equitable and does in some degree share the, um, the impact, the, the overflight impact. And then if you compare that with today, this is FAA's own slide. As you remember from last fall when we had the environmental assessment, the FAA published the slide with this blue 4L path. And we said, wait a minute, put the 4R on there. And they were nice enough with the intervention, by the way, of uh, Senator Timothy and uh, Representative Driscoll and yourselves to put that on. And it just shows, here's the expressway uh, entrance. Here's, you know, uh, Cedar Grove. I mean, it shows the concentration. So nothing in the... Uh, you know, nothing in the uh, uh, presentation by MIT uh, fully addresses those concerns. And so what we're going to need to do is to uh, continue our attempts at uh, engagement with uh, MIT and FAA and even and Congressman Lynch to request that MIT supplement its analyses and uh, with the benefit of that, try to continue to advocate for um, equity here. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Forty. I know I, I attended that meeting and I, I know Ms. Common did, some other members may as well. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Doherty? Mr. Zoulis? Uh, so really more of a comment, uh, and, and, and Tom can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, um, but it seems to me the challenge here, we reported at our last meeting uh, our discussions with the, um, the Quincy mayor and the other Quincy representatives and our attempts to have discussions with, <clears throat> pardon me, with uh, Braintree officials and Hingham officials about these flyable um, 
alternatives. And um, that didn't lead to uh, anything at all. Um, those communities, I think it's fair to say, aren't interested in um, discussing those flyable alternatives. And, uh, Quincy discussed it and they were very courteous and they listened in there. And, 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 and so, and we thank them for that. But, uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's fair to say that um, uh, that's, that, that they're not interested in, in joining us and in, in, in supporting those flyable alternatives. Seems to me the problem is for 33L, as Tom described it, you've got disproportionate impact across community. So you have a platform for the communities to decide how to share the burden. Similarly, in 27, you have disproportionate impact across community. So you have a platform for the communities to discuss how to share the burden. For 4R, the disproportionate impact is in one community. It's just in Milton. So there is no platform for the communities to discuss how to share the burden because understandably the communities that are not having any kind of disproportionate impact, Quincy, Braintree and Hingham are really not interested in changing the status quo uh, because the status quo is serving them fine. And I, and I, and I understand that. And it, you know, if I were there, I might take, I might take the same position. So given that, uh, the question is how, how what's what's the path forward on this? Um, uh, Katie raised back in October. Well, you know, it should be the FAA deciding this, not the communities. Someone's gonna, and 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 I think she's right. There has to be some the involvement of some uh, impartial Solomonic arbiter to um, to try to figure out how. Uh, to equitably share the burden and restore the dispersion that, that allows a shared burden, burden across community. Because right now in 4 hour, there is one community that has a disproportionate impact and that's Milton. And, and, and so uh, we, we can, we'll continue to try. Uh, we, we've tried, and as I said, Quincy, with the intercession of Senator Timothy to uh, help us meet, uh, Quincy was very, the representatives were very courteous, and uh, we had, you know, they met with us twice, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, understandably, they, they uh, don't uh, see a, a, a need, I think it's fair to say, to change uh, anything, certainly, certainly to disperse um, uh, and to have any kind of rotation system, as as we'd suggested. So, 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 uh, what's my point? Uh, uh, I think the only way we get to the end game on this is some kind of, uh, as I said, Solomonic impartial arbiter, whether it be the FAA, whether it be MIT, uh, whether it be uh, our congressional representatives, uh, to come in and say, well, listen, we we need to figure out how to restore. Um, a dispersion so that there is an equitable sharing of, bur of a burden as opposed to a disproportionate impact on one community. So that's, I probably talk too much, but that's, um, that's, uh, that's my view of this. And Tom, I, 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 you know, if there's anything I said that was wrong in there, uh, correct me, but I, but that's, that's my view on it at this point. I agree with that. It's not unique to us though. You look across San Francisco and uh, Phoenix and other places that, the, the, uh, there's a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Professor Arrow, who won a Nobel Prize for something called Individual Choice and Social Justice. And what he in, in, in talked about was the fact that where the initial condition is imposed by a, so, a central government, then the so-called uh, um, ethical metric of using what's called Pareto optimality, how do we make one uh, group better off without making anybody else worse off is inapplicable because the initial condition was imposed without consent on the, uh, the concentrated and uh, subjected entity. So uh, I think people at MIT understand that. I think that somehow or other, the communities that across the country are you know, subjected to the sky rail um, unilaterally uh, th th there's some solidarity there and presumably in the those that were inadvertently or otherwise benefited and don't want to uh, and, and want to keep the, the, the benefit without having 
it's anything reversed, need to look at what would what what their position would be if the shoe were on the other foot, and whether whether someone in Congress uh, and some some group of con congressional members collectively uh, can can address it. And I'll just add one more thing, and I, I don't want to over, overdo it, but the shoe may well be on the other foot in the future. Uh, I think some of these communities, I, I wish they, they would take the view or uh, 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 look, at, look at things in the way that um, if they did it to Milton, they can do it to other communities. Uh, if, they, if they can unilaterally impose this disproportionate burden on Milton, they can do it on other communities as well. And the only way for us to take control of this and for communities to take control of this is to work together on it. And so we were disproportionately burdened uh, back in 2013. It may be another community uh, in 2023. And so isn't it better for us to work together to try to uh, have some influence together? So again, I'm sorry for Thank you. Would anyone? Well, I, yes, I would, Madam Chair. I mean, at the end of the day, this is an FAA created problem, not only at Logan Airport, but around the country, and it's going to require a solution by the FAA. So I, I appreciate Tom and Mike doing a lot of outreach to these other communities. It's not, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world, and it takes time to set up the meetings and get everybody's availability, and it can be hard to coordinate. But I appreciate you at least sitting down and talking with Quincy and making that outreach. And we, we need to continue to um, reach out to Congressman Lynch and see what other help we can get from our congressional delegation and our federal delegation since it is a federal issue. But um, at the end of the day, that, that does continue to be my view that the FAA created this problem. The FAA needs to solve it, not only for us, but for everybody. So, um, but I, I think Mike and Tom should be commended for all of the work they're doing with the other communities and trying to, trying to set up those meetings and, um, and have those conversations. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for, for saying that. I, I absolutely agree. And it's not, a, it's not an easy conversation to have because of the position that we're in and, and, um, and uh, th the difficulty of talking to other communities about sharing this and, and re restoring some equity. So thank you. Um, is, there, is there anything else? Is there, are there some actions you'd like to talk about beyond what, what we have discussed? Um, no, I think that we need to continue our efforts to outreach, and I do think that uh, we should make a supplemental requ uh, request to MIT that they supplement what they've done um, and to follow up with regard to areas such as those uh, they mentioned, uh, well, there's a concern about merging, but look, this is MIT. Uh, <laughs> they, can, they can very uh, ably look at the, both the technology as it exists and, and, and the progeny of the technology that was developed 10 years ago, uh, as well as uh, the sidestep issue or other ways to uh, utilize uh, uh, a couple of methods to, to, to address the merging. I, I feel that is technologically addressable and therefore um, if they can come forward and we can create a record that that's not standing in the way, the more that we can narrow the issue down to one of equity, I think the, I think the better off we are. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I think uh, we look forward to formulating that, that, uh, that supplemental request quickly, as you said, because, you know, June 10th is, is not far away. Right. Did, did, does, did, Tom, do you need any authority to uh, I, that submit was, that? Or, or that was, I mean, as a member, you can probably submit it. Or uh, do you feel like you need our authority right, to, to follow? Like us to well, there's two different things. I could submit it on my own as a member of the FC, MCAC, but um, I think that we would have a lot more uh, uh, value if it were uh, supported by and endorsed by the, and indeed uh, I, I would want to get input and comment and re re refinement uh, from the select board uh, before uh, submitting it. Okay. You know, and I could do that, at, you know, uh, very readily. So maybe we should put that on for the next agenda. Yeah, exactly. Um, sure. I, that's the okay. 28th. So, um, okay. 
sure. unless we have an earlier meeting for some reason, which we yep. may. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Riordi. Okay. Thank you all. Good night, Tom. Thank Have you. Yep. Um, and next, we should have Kevin Cook joining us. We do, Madam Chair. Yep. Our Veterans Services Director, Kevin Cook, is here to talk about uh, the planning that's going on for this year's Memorial Day event. Yes. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Cook, and, and for hanging in there. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a long evening, I'm sure, for you, uh, waiting for your agenda. No, no, that's okay. You, you've got a longer evening than I do. <laughs> no, no worries, Madam Chair, and thank you for making time for me. Um, before we get into the business of Memorial Day, I want to say first and foremost uh, that I have observed our colleagues and others in the town of Milton all pulling together under the, the different uh, circumstances that are going on right now and, you know, coming up on a year of that. And I just want to commend uh, my colleagues. Uh, many have worked tirelessly. Uh, some of the people at the COA uh, and some of the staff there and, of course, ground staff and police, fire, everybody's kind of pitched in. It's just been an amazing thing. And, it, and as someone who's witnessed large, uh, you know, diverse operations, under difficult circumstances. I, I find this akin to some of what I've seen uh, in those areas and, you know, they are to be commended publicly and, uh, you know, they've done just a great job of keeping our town moving forward. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Cook. And we could say the same thing about you. We actually, uh, Mr. Dennehy shared your, um, your spotlight on the news um, and, uh, and, and we really appreciate your, um, <clears throat> uh, being there for our veterans and, and always providing uh, just a wonderful model of compassion and, and care for all people. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, no credit to myself. I, I was just there at the clinic getting my uh, shot uh, and uh, the gentleman from WBZ walked over and just asked if he could talk to me. And I said, yes, you can, but I'm Kevin Cook veteran tonight. I'm not representing anything I, else I do. And he understood, but it's good. If I encourage somebody else to step up and take care of their health and, and do the things that we as veterans need to do, uh, you know, like I said to my wife, I said, that's what I want to do. And that's, it was great. The, the VA mobile clinics are doing an amazing job getting the shots out to veterans, their families, their caregivers. Uh, you know, I'm personally involved with a couple of uh, veterans who needed help getting to that and talking with them. And it's just amazing that we can mobilize that much uh, effort to help our veterans, especially shut-ins. You know, that's the toughest ones. There are a lot of veterans with mobility issues. Uh, and I know that the police and firemen around our communities have been doing that also. So, you know, everybody's pitching in where they can. Well, that's good because um, it, it's been, it's well-earned and, um, and heartening to see that that veterans are being cared for in that way. And in this video proof, I got my vaccination now. So, uh, <laughs> um, so anyways, let's move on to Memorial Day. Thanks. And um, I did forward some information to you. So I just want to open it up and just ask if you have any questions first and foremost, and then I can kind of just get into what I've been able to do up to this point. Um, Thank you for the, the material in advance. I, I don't have questions. I think you'll probably answer um, a, anything I might have. Does anyone else have a question? No? Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, I, take it away. Okay, so what we're going to do this year is I'm, I'm requesting that we change the start time of our uh, ceremony at the cemetery to 11 a.m., mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, over the last five years, now that I've been the Director of Veteran Services for the Randolph and Milton Shared Service District, um, I've balanced my time. And it's been something that, you know, has had its ups, its downs. Um, you know, uh, Al Williams has, has been an able assistant and been able to help me, but now he's, he's focusing on a lot of, uh, you know, things under the COVID uh, because of his age, and that's fine. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to be there in person if I can. Uh, so I'm, I'm proposing we move the time to 11 a.m. 
what would happen uh, then is I'd be down in Randolph, you know, 10 to 10, 20 or so, and then come up and meet everyone at the cemetery and conduct a ceremony at 11. Uh, I came across the idea because I also forwarded you a copy of the Memorial Day yes. uh, observance program from 1948 that I did discover among the files in my office that I've been trying to clean up and uh, work on uh, when I can. Uh, 73 years ago, the ceremony started at 1045 in the morning. Uh, with the traditional parade, which we will not have this year. So I thought it was kind of a, almost like we're replicating what, some of what was done uh, back then after the end of World War II. Um, and I also wanted to present this material to you, and I'd like to present it to the town through uh, help with the Milton Times, I'm sure, and other outlets uh, to show people what was Memorial Day and the significance of all the different groups that were represented on the day and participated, including some of the groups that sound very similar to groups we still have around the War Parents of America, which probably it would be Gold Star families right now. Uh, and then, of course, the VFW, the American Legion, and some of these other groups now, you know, the United Spanish War Veterans. It's just an amazing piece of our town's history. So... It's kind of like I want to get people to think about our town, think about Memorial Day, and think about our hometown heroes. And that's going to kind of be the theme of this year's Memorial Day ceremony is, is remembering our hometown heroes. Um, you know, and part of that was looking for somebody, and I've been asked a number of times, we've had some very good speakers, um, do we have someone local? Well, we do. And he's a Vietnam War veteran and someone who's been very active in the community. Uh, recognized voice that I knew, you know, on my radio for many years, Mr. Rod Fritz, uh, who used to work at WBZ for about 30 years. And I've invited him to be our featured speaker. Wonderful. Um, well, um, I'm looking forward to some articles uh, uh, drawing on the past and the parallels to today. Uh, and whatever we can do to help um, on our end with that. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, just that I think the program looks good, Kevin, and thank you for your work in putting this together. It's too bad we can't have the parade, but I understand why. It's just always such a nice event. Hopefully next year. Yeah, yeah I look forward to that, Katie. I mean, it's it, it just, you know, I, I did speak with the... Uh, the schools, we are going to have a musical component, which I'm very, very happy for, um, because that is an essential part of any of these programs, and especially the student involvement. Um, I've still got to reach out to the middle school to get names for the 351 ambassador and obviously someone to recite General Logan's order. Um, we're, the Legion, I've uh, been in touch with them. We're going to try to figure out you know, which m members of the Legion are going to represent uh i had, did have a conversation with frank stout on the phone the other day so you know we still have time to work on that uh senator timothy's office going to be represented obviously i'm going to reach out to rep Driscoll also uh rabbi benjamin will be there very very pleased to have his involvement uh father bennett you know is going to probably be our uh invocation i haven't got a confirmation on that yet but i'm going to get that um and you know i'm just trying to bring the, the ceremony back to where we were. And I spoke with Lisa down at the cemetery and our hope is that if everything goes the way it's going right now, uh, under present conditions for COVID, that we could have the ceremony at the soldiers uh, section there in the cemetery where we traditionally would have it. Good. Um, thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Zulis. Just one question, Kevin. It looks like a great program. You outdo yourself every every year. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. Um, uh, it, now, are we are we still going to have the gen uh, the restrictions on the general public attending? Right now, from my understanding, is if we have an outdoor ceremony, it's it's very high. I mean, it's like two hundred fifty, maybe. Or, I, we, we would check because right now we're six weeks out essentially yep. seven weeks probably if I counted it. Uh, so, you know, it could change, but right now I got to believe if we're having an outdoor ceremony, we could have 150, 200 people socially spaced without issue. 
Um, you know, it, right. It's, I'm going to have to really take the temperature of the room probably the week before. Uh, and then, you know, working with the health agent and Mike and just, you know, make a call on, okay. And then put the information out as, as far and wide as we can on the public media. That's great. Yeah, I, I, um, it, it does look like a, a lovely program. So I hope we can have people in, in person. It worked well for Veterans Day. Um, and uh, as Mr. Dennehy said, our numbers uh, have been, you know, in the right direction. So, uh, so I, I hope that's something we can do. Um, and thank you for all your work. Oh, no problem. And again, I appreciate the support we get. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, and this will be going out, you know, shortly, of course, is we do have flags ready to be um, uh, placed okay. on the graves. We're going to have flags in coming up in early May. Uh, I'm scheduling it right now for May 8th, which is a Saturday. Uh, I like to do uh, Milton Cemetery early in May. Uh, I think the beauty of the cemetery is enhanced by the placement of the flags. Um, and, you know, that's something that people really enjoy. And I've, we've gotten a number of compliments. I'm sorry, it's Middleborough's finest just going by my house. Um, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the beauty of Milton Cemetery is just, it's something to me that every time I drive by, I really, I'm just amazed with the, in the history, of course. Um, you know, and once the flags are in place, you know, I've got a number of people who have called me or mentioned out to me and said, wow, you, you know, the volunteers do an amazing job every year. Uh, so we want to give everybody an opportunity to come and enjoy, uh, join us. And like we did last year, you know, we'll, we'll get scheduled times and we'll have small groups and, you know, but we'll still be able to cover the cemetery and make sure that all the graves get um, the recognition and, and the flag placement they deserve. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. No problem, Madam Chair. And thank you again, Select Board, for all your support. Thank you to the, the, the people of, of Milton. Uh, I'm proud to be part of the community, and I can't wait to represent you on Memorial Day. Well, we look forward to it. Thank you, Kevin. Good night. Take care. Thank you, sir. Good, Good luck. Um, okay. Um, Item 10, and I believe Allison Quinn is here. Yes. And um, Mr. Dennehy, was Mr. Freitag going to join us for this item? Or? I don't believe so, Madam Chair. Okay. I think right. Allison's going to present. Okay. Um, hello, Ms. Quinn. Um, welcome. I. Um, I, I think that you spoke with Ms. Conlon earlier today and you heard some of the, um, the questions that, that, uh, that we've had and, um, and some, some things that we're trying to do to make sure we can, can get this done. But please, please, um, I don't know if you have a presentation or, or a statement, but, uh, but it, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Collins. Thank you, members of the board. So I wasn't sure whether or not that this would move forward for tonight, but I can, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background so you, you understand how we got to where we are right now. So the farmer's market that takes place down in, in Milton Landing, to my knowledge, has been going on for decades. It was originally a select board vote. And from there, it entered into agreement the public health has been issuing its permit since then. Madam Chair. That's, that, that's my understanding of what's been happening. Ms. Um, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Quinn. Hold on. Mr. Denny, he's trying to say something. Oh, I thought sorry. we were talking about, I thought this agenda item uh, spoke to the SUFA equipment. Oh, no, this one, I'm sorry, is the farmer's market. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I should have announced that. My apologies. Um, <laughs> sorry. That, that, that's okay. So we uh, heard from Jean Boylan um, probably a couple months ago, if, if not a little bit uh, further back than that. He was interested in continue, seeing the farmer's market continue on in that space, but just didn't have the time, the capacity to really 
lead it anymore. Um, he's been doing it for years on his own with some help with some other volunteers. They've done a wonderful job. And he connected with Tim and Tim said, hey, I don't know. It's not really something typically that's in our wheelhouse, but let's let's bring it to the master plan implementation committee and, and see what they say. So I spoke with them. They did some back and forth conversations about it. We put it to a vote, a couple meetings after that. And they agreed because it is specifically called out in their master plan as a feature of the Milton Village area that they would be comfortable putting forward a $5,000 stipend uh, for a one-year pilot program um, to be managed by Parks and Rec and having Parks and Rec act as their fiscal agent. We've had a couple of hiccups, um, one being, I'm really not sure how we would enter into this contract. I couldn't find anything that was done before. So I was just trying to go off of some general background knowledge on how this would work. Kevin uh, Freitag has been really trying to help guide us through this and look for a solution. So having it go right now um, through MPIC for funding may not be the best fit, but I, I think we all have the same goal here. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just working out the kinks. Right. Yeah, I, I actually talked with Jean Boylan last year um, you know, just prior to what you usually is the, the lead up to the farmer's market uh, season. And because of COVID, they lost all their vendors. Uh, no, nobody was going to do this in person and they were all taking subscriptions, things like that. Um, so this is just as much a, a COVID issue as um, one that Jean doesn't live in Milton anymore. Um, and a lot of the other members um, some of them don't live in Milton. Some of them, you know, are, are um, have sort of retired out of this, and, um, and and it does need to be reinvigorated. I think partly because COVID uh, pre prevented that from happening last year. So so now they they they're faced with uh, a need for a one time um, sort of cash infusion or a little grant to um, to hire a manager and. You know, in the past, we haven't had a contract or anything. Kevin Freitag, town council, did, um, did, did, he's still researching, um, but he did research MPIC um, and the vote that established it. And it doesn't seem that they can actually use their funds for this, but the select board actually has, you know, we, we have a much broader mandate and authority. And so um, between that and perhaps um, res the reserve fund, which we put an additional $250,000 into um, because we didn't know what kinds of things would, would be needed um, because of COVID. Uh, um, Kevin feels as if there is a mechanism and a way to go forward. And um, I, I think what will happen is we'll have to have a very short meeting next week. There's a, there's a timing issue because they need to hire someone for, for like May 1st in order to get this up and running. So I, I don't know um, if anyone has any questions or comments right now that, that we'd like to just pose and pass on to Kevin or, um, or you know, or, or Allison or, or questions for Allison. Mr. Zulis? Well, it, it seems like w w um, we need to uh, determine how to get $5,000 if we want to go forward with this. Is that the idea? Yes, or, 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 or if they need less. I think we, I think there's, we, we want to clarify if they really need $5,000. Oh, I see. We don't know. So, what the so, so, okay. so the, the number, the number that was asked for originally was three. And then I think, um, I, I think that there was a concern uh, that, that maybe more was needed. So that's one thing that we want to clarify is dollar amount. But yes, the other thing, the, the other thing that we want to clarify is, um, you know, where to fund it from, um, where is appropriate. And um, he's, he's reaching out to, um, to DOR, I think. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me, pardon me, it seems that we, we can decide that. I mean, we, you know, we have, we have some funding that, you know, uh, that we have some authority over. Right. There's also an anti-aid issue. So that needs to be cleared up. 
So it's a little more complicated. Sorry, I didn't mention the anti-aid um, issue before. Yeah, well, oh, okay. Uh, I, I just, I, I, I would, I would just, I hope we don't get too com complicated. I'm, I'm trying wanna, to make this as yeah. simple as possible. Yeah, I, think, I think that's a good idea. I think that's yeah, good. but but um, but it, you know, we're used. We don't don't turn your microphone off yet. I want to hear <laughs> where you were going. No, I, I was just going. I was just, uh, you know, if 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 uh, if it's three thousand dollars, and uh, if it's something that we could fund out of the select board budget, then maybe we should consider that. But if we don't know the amount yet, then we then we can't. Uh, it seems to me we can't we can't consider that at this point. So, um, but anyway, that's just a thought. So you I were. Think, you were, yes, Ms. Conlon. I, I think part of the issue is town council was only very recently consulted on this, so there's some legal issues here that he's trying to look at in terms of how other, some communities fund this through a 501c3 farmer's market, nonprofit. Some is one community that has a parks department staff or who this is part of the job. So there's a few different ways of looking at this. And Kevin is doing some research to figure out how, how we may best be able to help this situation mm -hmm. for, for a one year right. start to uh, reinvigorate it. Right. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, th thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Quinn. We really appreciate your, your, um, your sticking with us. Uh, it's 9.06. I realize that, um, you know, you've had a long day. Um, but, uh, okay. but you also have uh, a presentation for us on SUFA, in, uh, information yeah. lines for public spaces. Oh, Mr. Doyle? Just a question, clarification, Madam Chair. Uh, are we now uh, just deferring this until our next meeting. Yes, and I, and and I think we we may need to call, um, unfortunately, uh, a, a meeting on on an off week for this, okay. but it would be very short. Just this item. Okay, and I was just going to suggest that if um, the request is for a ceiling of five thousand dollars, and we could, in that respect, say that we have the wordings read something to the effect of up to five thousand dollars. Um, to think about that as a possibility right. between now and then. Well, we, I um, oh between now and then, yes. I, I didn't I didn't know if you were suggesting we just try to uh, um, move something now. Um, well, actually, that was in my mind, and that's that's, what I thought that's, you, you that's why I made that notation for myself about five minutes ago, um, because today was National Gardening Day, and <laughs> the seeds are in the ground. Um, yeah, I would, would people feel comfortable with that? Not, you know, not having some of the specifics ironed out. I mean, we haven't had a contract in the past. Um, so, and, and it, I don't think we need a fiscal agent. We're just making sure that there's, um, that this group has money in order to, to get this, get through this season and also create a sustainable plan. Ms. Conlon? Madam Chair, I think town council needs time because he was consulting with DLS this afternoon. So I don't think he's had an answer, I, you know, unless he, unless someone, you know, Mike Dennehy or you heard that he had an answer, but. No, uh, I, I, I haven't heard anything. I think whatever whatever motion we would make it would have to be subject to an, a, a, a bunch of uh, a, a contingencies, basically. So. I think then it would be best to just defer this. Yeah. yeah. That, that was his advice to me. I apologize. That's when. When Miss Quinn started talking about this agenda item, I thought we were just going to completely defer. Oh, he, okay. Well, he spoke to the town of Hingham today. He spoke to DLS today. Right. He's trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So. Okay. Well, he didn't mention deferring it outright. He's he. We were we were as you like to say, kind of wetting people's beak on this so that it didn't come out of left field later. But thank you very much, Mr. Dennehy. Um, okay, Miss Quinn, we're on to Sufa. Thank you. Uh, I think Hillary has some slides that she's going to pull up for me. SUFA is an outdoor, well, I can't fully call it an outdoor advertising. It's also kind of a street furniture company. They're local. They're a startup. Um, they're from Cambridge. They reached out to us quite some time ago about seeing if Milton would be interested in participating in their program. There's several abutting municipalities participate in this, Quincy being one, Boston being one, Somerville being one. Uh, I, 
the the reason that they are reaching out to us is because we are transportation transportation supported, and their model requires that there be some higher foot traffic so that people see what is on these boards. These boards stand roughly eight eight feet tall and, and four feet wide at the base. Uh, the way that the it works is that they design with the town a, a bunch of you, what you're seeing where it says neighborhood news feed, that's a panel that was created specifically for that town. You can use it for public information. You can use it to put up a map of historic districts. You can put COVID related information. You can put menus on it. It's interchanging and it's almost interchanging instantly. They have one person on their end that manages what the what data goes onto those panels. And then someone on our end would put that request in to have it updated. So they, they make these um, specific for each municipality. Um, Hillary, will you grab the next slide, please? Thank you. So this is an overview of, of how things work. Um, you, it's real-time data. They have the ability to measure pedestrian traffic, uh, which is very helpful for a town like Milton to understand how, how much tra foot traffic we get through our commercial districts. They're responsible for all the installation and maintenance. And they have several local partners. They do do advertising. So I, I wanna be clear that this is an opportunity, the way that they generate revenue is through advertising. Uh, they're solar, they're solar powered. Um, they require very little maintenance on their part. And the request from them would be that they need four foot space of, of sidewalk in order to install these. Um, Hillary, next slide, please. Uh, so this generally was the feedback that I received from, from them after uh, several meetings and conversations. I did a little research. I spoke with some former colleagues at the Boston Redevelopment Authority so that I could really understand exactly what this means for a town like Milton and things that we need to be aware of should we decide that this is something that could potentially be possible. Uh, the town would get roughly 20% um, of the revenue, which means three to 4,000 per sign, which doesn't seem like a lot of money, but it also allows for a, a smaller, you know, kind of like a revolving fund. So if you wanted to put it right back into that little local district, you could. Uh, if you wanted to put it towards kids' sports programs in that area, you could. Uh, generally, my understanding that I got was that the the teeth for the town comes from how how we want to regulate a contract, so whatever that licensing agreement would look like, um, and that we had control of any advertising that you know we could restrict what we wanted, and that we were able to capitalize on this opportunity to put information out there instantly to residents of Milton to share upcoming events, um, share our public meeting calendar, share agendas, wh wh whatever it is that we feel like we would wanna put out. Hillary, I think there's one more slide. So again, they maintain it, um, you know, there's, there's no wires, there's no excavation, there's no electricity. Um, Generally, they come in and they they consider themselves a community amenity. Um, I guess it depends on how how we want to evaluate community amenity, but I thought it was at least worth bringing to your attention as a a potential small source of revenue um, and something that you know it doesn't seem like a heavy lift if it's well regulated. Um, and that's really all I got for you. Thank you, Allison. Um, sure. Do members have questions or comments? Hey. Ms. Conlon? Oh. I have a question. How many, hey. how many of these signs, Allison, are in communities that have purchased them? You know, are we talking just business districts and a handful or more than that? So it, it, it fluctuates. So, um, you know, I, I look at, when I was at Boston, I really had to break it down by neighborhood 
to understand what the impacts were. So those neighborhoods that have high density, high traffic, like downtown, um, the downtowns, Back Bay, Beacon Hill, those areas have them uh, kind of spaced out, but still close to public transportation. Then you get further out uh, in Dorchester on, on Dot Ave, there's a couple close to public transportation. They use a different vendor than SUFA. Um, Somerville does use SUFA and it is close to their commercial districts and or places where people are going to and from public transportation. Uh, Quincy has a couple, one in their downtown area, which, you know, it, it's really hard to compare it because, you know, I, I think about our Milton's business districts um, and they just don't have the volume or the density as our surrounding neighbors. We tried to look to see outside further um, with like Weymouth or Braintree or, or any of, of those areas. And it was really difficult for me to kind of understand how they, how they work because this is such a new product. There really isn't a lot of information available. Um, but, but generally, I think um, for a town like Milton, it would be, you know, kind of slow and steady wins the race if it was even something that, that the select board found was a good fit or worth, you know, further investigation. Thank you. Mr. Doyle? I'm fine, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, um, Allison, did you have some ideas about location? Yes. So during our conversations, a, a few areas kind of came to, to mind. Um, Central Ave, the uh, MB, MBTA trolley station is, is right there. There's a wider sidewalk. Uh, it connects to the city. There's a lot of foot traffic. And I think the visibility um, would be useful there. Um, there's not a lot of obstructing it. You can see it from many different angles. Uh, another spot that kind of came to mind was um, potentially, um, you know, something over by where the the new um, park is going to be, over what the, what the expressway is. Um, you know, that's an area that may potentially see a lot of foot traffic, but. It, you know, it was really hard for me to share data with them because we've been experiencing COVID and, it, you know, it's it's not that easy. So we had to kind of look at it as, you know, what we know. So we know that the, the trolley station is at Central Lab. There's another one down in Mil Milton Village, but East Milton potentially could provide another opportunity where there'd be a lot of foot traffic and you wouldn't worry about someone getting caught up in one of these trying to take a curb or riding a bike or, or something like that. So those were the types of things that we looked at and we came up with potentially those three spots. Okay, um, great, uh, thank you. And uh, do, do you have some next steps for us? Um, this is just sort of a, an initial introduction for us, but. Um, this is the, I just wanted to make you aware that we had been having these conversations, uh, you know, we've done as much kind of homework as we can on our end. I wanted to bring it to your attention so that you know, generally you could let me know whether or not I should pers pursue looking at this further or uh, if you guys have some reservations about I, something like this. I, I think, you know, the idea of outdoor advertising and street furniture uh, can be, gets mixed reviews. Um, this isn't going to be, you know, that $100,000 a year revenue that I would love to see, um, but it's something and it can be put right back into the community. And these aren't, you know, these aren't big giant mechanical blinding things. They're small and they're actually meant to provide us with some kind of public service in return for their installation. So it might not be a, a bad idea just to kind of have S so SUFA come in and maybe have a follow-up conversation to see if they can provide us with a little bit more information or data on on how it's been going from them. Okay, thank you. Mr. Doyle. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I think this would be an enhancement to community communications. Um, locations, of course, as Allison indicated, would be critical. Also, the 
the messaging, putting on an old marketing hat, it differentiated, for example, there may be something um, that would combine the messaging and the marketing for playgrounds that would be different from the tea stations, that would be different from uh, the, uh, the areas of the park where baseball takes place um, and so on down the line. So thinking this out well, um, would be extremely important so that when it gets off the ground, it is immediately seen as uh, enhancing and uh, sought after for the future. Ms. Conlon? I'm sure I have a suggestion. I, I think it might make sense to ask Allison Quinn to do a little more due diligence for us, mainly to I think Allison maybe put together a recommendation of what your your thoughts are, maybe put together a memo for us. I'd like to get a little bit of input from the Chamber of Commerce and maybe the Milton Village Neighborhood Association and the East Milton Neighborhood Association, since those are the areas that it's being proposed. And I, you know, I think the neighborhood associations could solicit, take a short time, not a lot of time to get a little feedback from some of their members and see what people think. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing what the chamber thinks. And I, and I also think we should see what the town administrator thinks in terms of um, burden on updating this with news. You know, we we don't have the staff that we used to have in the select board office. There's just not as many people. And there's a lot, there's not a lot of resources and, and a lot of work on the people that we have. And I, you know, if this is, is as important as communication is, I, I just want to see if we have the resources to be able to provide when updates to this, because it sounds like it's something the communities are updating either on a daily basis or maybe several times a week with news. So we'd want to find out what the administrative burden might be to provide that to SUFA. And, um, and maybe it's none, but I think we should look into that. So I think it would be good to have the planning staff come forward with sort of a written recommendation for us after doing some of that follow-up and, and then we could meet with SUFA if, if we want to move it forward. I'd be happy to do that. That sounds like a very logical next step. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. Mr. Dennehy? Uh, yeah, I think this, this is a great idea. I want to thank uh, Allison again. This is what our planning and community development team is, is out there looking find, to find better ways to do stuff. In, in my capacity in Boston, um, we basically inherited all of the street furniture was there. It was a full-time position in Boston. Uh, you have all the solar barrels downtown that had advertising on it. That was a little more static. Those were printed ads that would be changed out uh, by the maintenance crew. Um, these would be, you know, something that we could program. And we're always looking for more VMS boards in town to try to get our messages out to folks. Uh, we try to centrally locate those. Um, so again, I, I agree with the vice chair's recommendation that they come up with a memo with specific locations, but uh, great work to, to get it to this point. And uh, I'll certainly sit with, with the neighborhood associations and, and take their input on it. Um, but it, they are a success in certain locations in, in, in greater Boston. I can also reach out to Somerville and see how they're using them um, to, to, to promote the community messages. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That, that would be- Thank you, Allison. Help. Yes. Madam yes. Chair, just in terms of the neighborhood associations, I'm not suggesting that we have a lot of meetings or take a lot of time to do this. I think just some informal response from, from mm -hmm. them would be helpful as well as the chamber. Happy to do that. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, um, item number 12. Um, Butters request to purchase parcel abutting 145 and 167 Lyman Road. Uh, we, we did receive um, uh, two letters from um, Mary McKetrick and uh, it would be uh, um, a, a good idea, I think, for us to continue this conversation. Um, the, the question, the ultimate question is whether we want to declare this land um, as surplus and put out an RFP, make it available for sale. Um, and at last we left it, we had a few questions. We had had the site walk um, and uh, uh, had questions about whether um, they would want to lease the land for the 30 year term that we have left until, um, you know, for the golf course lease. Um, 
it doesn't seem that that's a, a, of interest. So um, we're, we're back here talking about a possible um, sale if, if we'd like to declare it surplus. So um, I don't know if people have questions or if somebody would like to, to make a comment. And we, we might not, we, we might just want to do nothing at this time. You know, that, that's also possible. Mr. Doyle, you're muted. Mr. Doyle, you're still muted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've been thinking about this over time because of the relationship to um, other bodies in town, such as the Conservation Commission, et cetera. You saw some work attendant to that. And um, uh, Mr. Dennehy has recently shared information about the drainage lines location, which the DPW was able to um, locate and excavate uh, to confirm. Um, the maps don't give yet the measurements of the width. I just did some rough analysis myself a while back, and it seems like um, the access way is about 37 feet wide, uh, but we need to have all of that confirmed. I think we need to confirm what, if it was declared surplus, the non-surplus portion would be uh, for uh, people in the neighborhood and outside the neighborhood to access. We talked about something of the vicinity of 10 feet, but we haven't made a determination. So there's another matter to be considered. Uh, if it becomes surplus, where would a driveway be? We, we don't have a rough sketch um, of what the layout of proposed development might be. Not that we want to uh, financially burden any of the parties, but um, we, I, in my mind, I don't think we want to have the driveway um, in the access area. So a number of questions again to be thought out uh, before we get too much further down the line on this, at least from my perspective, those are just a few thoughts. And I'm thinking about this in terms of everybody's interest, uh, questions that need to be answered before a sound decision can be made. Mr. Zoulis? And this is ultimately a town meeting decision. Yes. Right. Okay, yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, so my thoughts are really not significantly different than they were in November when I think we last took this up. You know. It, to me, the question is what's in the best interest of the town and do we even want to consider declaring this surplus? Um, I am not inclined to do so for two reasons. And one is not only do we have the issue of the current use, which I, I understand we've just been talking about an easement and uh, there's not an interest in a lease, but there was some suggestion of that at the last meeting we had. So an easement could potentially address that. But for me, the bigger issue is the future of the golf course. And this is an important access point to a very large portion of town owned land. We don't know what the town is going to, a future generation is going to make this decision. We don't know what the town's going to want to use that land for in 30 years. Maybe we'll continue the golf course. Maybe there'd be a separate Milton golf course with nine holes, maybe a solar farm, maybe there'd be development option up there. The, the other access points at Quarry Lane and Orchard and Bailey really present other challenges because they're not as easily accessible. There's ledge. There's some parkland, as I understand it, up in that area. Um, the main access point would be the dump access road, the former dump access road. But really, this is the most significant entry point into the golf course. And as we know, for the next 30 years, we need to have some public access provided because that was negotiated. And from what I understand from a former member of this board and the former town administrator who I talked with in the fall about this issue, that was a heavily negotiated point because the quarry and the Lyman neighborhoods were looking to maintain that public access. But the bigger issue for me is the future of the golf course. And it, you know, I, I did see in Attorney McKetrick's letter that a road may or may not be feasible because of the conservation issues, but the, the road may not be what the access is needed for. At some point, it might be pedestrian access or foot access or some other you know, utility access. So 
I think we have to be really careful and take a long-term strategic view. And based on that perspective, speaking individually as one member of the board, I, I would not be inclined to declare the surplus. And I just want to state my reasons. And my, my main reason is for the future of the Gulf Coast being so uncertain and needing to provide for access for the town, for a future board or future town meeting to decide um, and to have that option rather than selling it at this point in the 30 years, the town being in a position where we might need to take land by eminent domain and pay for land by eminent domain in order to have access to whatever the future use might be at that location. So that, that's my, I understand. I mean, I think it's entirely reasonable for the abutter to the property to want to make this overture to the town to see if there's an interest in the town to sell it. My thinking is that it's not in the town's long-term strategic interest to give up an important access point to a, sig a significant property. A town, open land and open space in this town and developable land. And the golf course may or may not be now because it's, you know, it's, it's still settling, but and there's a 30 year, 30 years to go on the lease, but at some point that might be developable land. And I think that we need to be very careful about what we do now that might impact future options for the site. So that's my view. Thank you. Um, well, you're, you're right. I mean, there is ledge on some in some of those other access points that make make putting a road in difficult. I, um, Mr. Denny and I spoke with Steve Ivis and um, and Chase, and uh, Mr. Ivis did say that um, that you could put a road in um, at this access point. Um, you you would just cross the wetland. Um, but to your point there may be other access needs that maybe a 10 foot easement wouldn't be adequate for. Um, you know, I, I don't know necessarily what those would be. I think um, Mr. Berkeley thought that the storm water, um, you know, because of where it is could, could be um, taken care of, but in 30 years, um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't know what may happen. So I understand your point. Um, so, um, Mr. Doyle and Mr. Zulis, it sounds as if you would like some of these other questions answered before um, us moving forward and, and um, taking a vote about whether we'd like to declare it surplus or not. Mr. Doyle. Uh, I can only speak for myself, but I, I think so. We should really have a checklist that includes everything that's put on the, the table of what Katie said to um, the points that I raised this questions that need to be answered. The conservation issue is a big one for consideration as well. And um, the, the risk of putting the town in a box if this is surplused, it does not have a future when the town needs it for the future as Katie was saying. And so, so uh, um, better or manner than I was just vocalized, or verbalized. Um, I, I, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. I agree that that's the way to tee this up for decision. Okay. Um, Mr. Doyle, I didn't write all of your questions down. Um, would, would, would you mind um, writing them down just so we can make sure we have them and, and we get them answered? Sure, be happy to send you an email. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, excellent. Okay, let's move on. Um, so uh, discussion project eligibility letter applications. Um, so we did receive, the board received um, an application for uh, 728 Randolph Avenue. So it's a parcel that um, abuts the dump access road. And um, we're not discussing this this evening. What we're doing this evening is starting to schedule um, a public meeting where we'll we'll cover this. I'm in the past. Sometimes um, project proponents have come in and and given the board a, a presentation of the project. Would the board be interested in doing that in this case? In requesting that, sure. I mean, 
okay. get more information. I, you know, right. I, I mean, it, I think it, I think it worked well. Um, um, the proponents of the ice house came in and, and I, I thought that was quite good. So, um, so hopefully we can, we can invite the, the, um, the applicant. Um, and again, this is, this is a project eligibility letter application to mass housing. So this is for a 40B, a comprehensive um, um, multifamily housing project um, of 40 home ownership units, 10 of which would be affordable uh, on, this, on this parcel, um, 728 Randolph Ave, just to be clear for the public. So our next regular meeting is the 28th. We've been given an extension of 30 days that so we haven't received the official letter. Um, we got that verbally, so we need, and I don't know how that will shake out because the 6th of May, um, I think is, oh no, actually um, June, sorry, um, is a Sunday. So I don't know if it'll end up being the 4th or the 7th, um, but somewhere around there. Mr. Dennehy? Yes, Madam Chair, I, I did receive uh, written uh, oh, confirmation good. from Mike Busby. Oh, the good. deadline has been extended till June 7th. Oh, great. Thank you. Give us a couple extra days. Good. Okay. And by um, my calculations, this board would meet May 12th and May 26th. Right. So, so would we like to do this on the 12th um, or would we like to start on the 28th? Um, Ms. Conlon? I just wonder how, do we know, or do we have a sense of how full the 28th is at this stage? No, we don't. Um, if the, I guess the, the positive of putting it on the 12th is that we have plenty of time to ask the applicant to come in, but um, that, that, gives, that gives us a lot left running room, I guess, um, for, for comments, although staff can get their comments started um, now, so. Mr. Dennehy? Yes, so uh, town planner Tim Zawinski forwarded the comprehensive application to department heads and they're beginning to work through the process themselves. Um, I don't anticipate a heavy agenda for the 28th, um, knowing that we have town meeting on the 3rd, so we probably wouldn't put too much on that agenda, but um, I, I don't have much at this time for April 28th, um, okay. so that, that might be available for, for our first meeting. Okay. Uh, um, should, should we authorize the chair to reach out to the, or you know, working with someone in town hall to reach out to the developer and just see if they're available on the twenty eighth and if not, scheduled for the twelfth? That's what I was going to say. We we can we can see how that that pans out. Okay. Um, Would it be the twenty eighth or the twenty sixth? The twenty eighth of April. Is it Friday? Is our next? Oh, uh, maybe my calendar's wrong. May. No, April. April 28th is a Wednesday. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and I say that only because I, this is a handwritten calendar, Arthur. I was not being funny. No, it's all right. I was <laughs> reversing them. <laughs> um, and, I, and I make mistakes like that all the time. Yes, Mike. And would we, would we also uh, make sure that we have uh, uh, plenty of notice so the residents can come in and give their thoughts well, as well. That, that, that's that, that's the really, that's the really important thing to make sure that we get this out the, in the usual ways, email blast. Um, we can do, yes, Mr. Dennehy. Uh, yes. So uh, I'm, I'm going to back off the 28th being viable. Um, we have a public hearing that night. Um, that's right. And we have the uh, equity and social justice uh, for all okay. committee coming in. So Maybe okay. the twelfth. Maybe the May twelfth is is that, that's more better. Right. Okay. So that will give us plenty of time um, to do that. And and as you said, um, Mr. Zawinski already uh, forwarded the comprehensive permit to uh, or or the application. Sorry, that's not the comprehensive permit application. The 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 um the PL application to staff and and did. How other boards and committees, the planning board, CONCOM, everybody like that has gotten it too. I sent it to April Anderson. So the planning board has it. Um, I normally don't send it to CONCOM, but, but I certainly can. 
Okay, I don't, I don't, I haven't looked at it closely enough to know if there are any wetlands issues, so it may not even be necessary. Um, um, but okay, that that's great. So then um, we'll reach out and ask for a presentation. Okay, thank you. And then uh, 652 Canton Avenue, we just, um, I, I just would like to let the board know that um, two, two weeks ago um, on a Thursday evening, uh, Senator Timothy let myself and Mr. Dennehy know that he had scheduled a meeting with Mass Housing uh, relating to 652 Canton Avenue and, um, and uh, we haven't received word that, that the, their PEL has been granted yet. Um, and um, he, as I said, invited us to this meeting um, and uh, wanted to talk about process. And we, we, did, we did attend and Judy Barrett and Johanna Schneider also attended. Um, they were both interested and um, Crystal Cornegay, who is the executive director of Mass Housing, also was there, as, as well as Paul McMorrow, who heads the, the unit that, that um, grants the, the PLs. So um, there's not a lot to report other than um, Ms. Cornegay did try to get uh, Mr. McMorrow to give us a better idea of when we might either see see some sort of official notice of whether or not a, a, a PL would be granted. Um, and um, so far we haven't really heard anything. So um, that's all I have to report on that. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, see. Um, I, I don't know how much we really need to discuss on the 40B proposals. Uh, as I, I think you probably all know, the, the Milton residences are, uh, or the residents, it, residences at East Milton, sorry, um, in, in East Milton Square are coming up this week. The, the hearing is going to open tomorrow. Um, I won't be able to be there because I'll be at the design charrette for the 432 Adams Street station. So, um, but it is the, it's the opening hearing. So I don't expect there to be any um, testimony. It's usually scheduling and such. So oh, they, they did that already. They did that. Oh, they did that. December, or January. Yeah. Okay. So I think this will be testimony. Okay. So it will be. Okay. So, so people, people will be really interested to hear that. I'll, I'll have to watch the recording. Thank you, um, Katie. Uh, but does anyone have, have anything? I, I know we've been talking about um, when, when, if and when, to make some uh, supplementary comments on 582 Blue Hill Avenue, you know, there was a, a, a conceptual design change on that. I don't know if everybody's been following it. So yeah, it's about 92 units now and the, the home and the, and the garden um, are retained in, in this most current version. Um, and also uh, at some point, whether we want to um, make any further comments on 648 can't nav. Um, they're going back to the drawing board on that one as well. Um, be the, the water issues there in, in addition to um, water quality and um, questions about the MS4 permit, uh, which you know you, you can't waive those. Uh, that's a federal program. So there, there, there are just a lot of issues there. Um, and then, and then ice house. So, does anyone have any comments or 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 wish to talk about making um, supplementary statements? Or, um, Madam Chair, I think six forty eight cancer is probably a little premature for the reason you said, but I, I think the board might be interested in commenting on the redesigned five eighty two Blue Hill Avenue, which um, you know is is a reduced number of units, but other challenges given the design. So. Maybe that's something we could take up. If we do have a meeting next week, maybe that's something we could take up at that meeting. I know it's getting late. It's quarter to 10. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, 
Um, item 15, uh, the appointment process for community preservation committee. It's almost 10. I don't think this needs to be a lengthy discussion. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to say that I, I think it's a, a good time, even though it hasn't been approved by the AG's office, I think it's a good time to get to the other boards and committees and just get them thinking about their nominees. I, I, I know that um, those boards or bo elected boards will be changing um, you know, some, some uh, membership, but it, it, I, I'm happy to just send out an email and make sure that they know that once their membership changes, that they, they, they should think about appointing someone um, uh, unless they want to do it beforehand, I suppose. Um, yes, Mr. Zulis. I was just going to say, why don't we set a date and say, look, we're, 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 we're going to, we're planning to appoint this committee, um, you know, in early June or by June X, can you please have your appointee ready to go by then? You know, it seems to me we may want to have the committee in place before the beginning of the fiscal year. Although I guess there's no magic to that because the money's not in yet, but, but um, um, it seems to me we, we want to get this committee appointed, you know, sometime early in the summer. Right. Well, that, that's what I was hoping. I, I, um, Mr. Freitag had said we have to wait until it's approved by the AG's office, but I, I would hope that's quite soon. So I'm not sure why we can't at least have, have everyone chosen and then just a, a, um, a, a point. So, um, so I like your idea about setting a date. Um, so, uh, so we'll just say early June and um, if anyone has a date they wanna propose, uh, When's when's our meeting in early June? Oh, why, don't, why don't we stay on our first first our first meeting in June? And Mr. Doyle, did you want to say something? Our first meeting would be. No, I was just going to concur. I think this is yeah just critical to get the uh, yeah. appointees lined up right in advance. Um, Thank you for that. Great. June 9th. So, so so June June ninth, and I think we're collecting quite a bank of bank of um, applications, and uh, I uh, I I think. Um, I, I'm not sure if the committee would would like to look through all the applications. Um, I, I know that we've said in the past that we've been concerned about putting um, every name that's going that's being considered out on a public agenda. agenda. Um, but um, in this case, it, you know, we we may not feel the same way about this one. Uh, but but I think there are a lot of great. Um, applications that that we've received that I've seen. I don't know if other people have been able to see them. We can't really talk about them here, but um, but uh, but it would be good if we could think about how we'd like to handle that. I'm I'm happy to um, to to um, to just handle that in in a meeting. But if if other people have different ideas and would like um, a slate, um, then we could talk about that. No, I, I see. Yeah, Miss Collins. Okay, great. Well, that's. 15's done. <laughs> okay. Um, so item 16, um, Bob Amelia to the, I hope I pronounced the same right, um, to the retirement board an appointment. May I have a motion? I'll move that we appoint Bob Amelia of 89 Otis Street to the retirement board with a term expiring on April 30th, 2023. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, um, Ms. Conlon. Yes. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Zulis. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. Excellent. Um, uh, next is approval of Wallston Golf Club change of directors. May I have a motion? I'll move to I'll move to approve up, up to approve an amendment uh, to the ABCC application for the change of officers directors at the Wallston Golf Club. Second. I'll second. Okay, Katie. Uh, I just wanted to make a notation that. Where it lists its directors, if I remember correctly, one of the directors was entered twice at James uh, Bettini. So that may be something that they can correct. I think it's just a clerical error. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, Ms. Conlon? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zolas? Yes. Ms. Collins, yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 
addendum to lease of patio heating equipment for the town of Milton to Milton's Opus LLC doing business as steel and rye. Madam Chair, I have a question. This just came over late afternoon. Are we just increasing the number of equipment? That's what it looks like. There's no date change or anything like that. It's just from 11 to 14 heaters, but the propane tanks stay the same. All right. Okay. And I'll move that we approve the addendum to, of le to lease of patio heating equipment um, to the uh, Milton's Opus LLC doing business at Steel and Rye. Second. Second. May I make a friendly amendment? Um, and authorize the town administrator to sign? Yes, I'll accept that. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, Ms. Conlon? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zoulis? Yes. Ms. Collins, yes. Um, uh, um, application to use the streets and ways for the Milton Monster Dash, October 31st, 2021. This is a foundation for education's um, annual fun run. Um, actually, it's quite serious, but there's lots of fun. Um, I'll move to approve the application to use streets and ways for the Milton Mon Monster Dash on October 31st, 2021, Halloween, with a rain date of November 7th, 2021. Second. Great. Thank you. All those in favor, Ms. Conlon? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Excellent. Um, See, approval, license and reservation of rights to the Smithsonian Institution Archives of the American Gardens for Archival uh, of Pierce Middle School Arboretum. This is, um, this is a, a project that Beth Neville um, worked on and, and, and uh, with help from the 350th um, committee and uh, Actually, they, they planted the trees not, not long ago um, during COVID. And so um, they would, since we, since the select board um, has purview over the property, we need to sign this in order for it to be um, uh, our licensed, so. I'll move to approve the license of reservation of rights to the archives of, archives of American Gardens and to authorize the town administrator to sign the release form. Second. All those in favor, Ms. Conlon? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Another another gardening uh, related agenda item for gardening day. Um, gardening. So um, uh, item number 21, Arbor Day is the 30th. And um, we, we could we could save this if anybody wanted to alter it, but otherwise I'll I'll accept a motion. Madam Chair, I move to approve the Arbor Day Proclamation and declare April 30th as Arbor Day in the town of Milton. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, Ms. Conlon? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins, yes. Um, and next, the Earth Day Proclamation. Um, and I know we usually read these out loud. Forgive me. I, I'm I'm just cognizant of the time and that everyone is probably tired because there's a lot going on. Would you like me to read the proclamations? I don't, I don't think we need to, Madam Chair. I'll move that we approve the Earth Day proclamation and declare April 22nd as Earth Day in the town of Milton. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, Ms. Conlon? Yes. Mr. Doyle? Yes. Mr. Zulis? Yes. Ms. Collins, yes. Okay. On a related question, Madam Chair, uh, yes. to Katie's point, your point, will it be posted on the town's website? Yes. Great. Okay, well. I'll do it. Okay. Um, um, next approval of meeting minutes. Um, dates January 27th, 2021, February 10th, February 22nd, February 24th, March 1st, March 10th, March 15th, March 24th, March 31st, all of 2021. Um, if that's a motion, I will second it. it uh, yes, so so moved. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and thank you, thank you for. Uh, I, I read through um, the the edits, and I appreciate those. Um, all those in favor, Ms. Conlon. Yes. Mr. Doyle. Yes. Mr. Zulos. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yes. Um, Just a related note of thanks to the preparers for all of these. 
Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Hillary, and thank you, um, Katie, for um, for your eagle eye and and your your pen. Um, oh, thank you. But it's mostly thank you, Hillary. Well, yeah. No, I I I, I really appreciate um, both your efforts um, and Hillary trying to keep us up to date all the time. We make it hard. Um, Okay, so future meeting dates. So we have our standing meeting on April 28th. We may need, as I said, a short meeting next week uh, to, to try to resolve the farmer's market. I don't know if people would like to just say that we would have a meeting on the 21st, um, you know, a short meeting on the 21st, or, or if we'd like to try to put something together at another time if this comes together. I can do the 21st. I can do the 21st. Yep. Okay. So let's just, let's just say that, um, seven o'clock seven. Yeah. I don't, it, it can just be a very short, um, meeting. um, okay, great. So 28th and, um, pre-town meeting at 6.30, right? That should be enough time, right? I think so. Um, and I think we, we, we should be thinking about whether we'll be in person. I, I, this is a really long warrant and I, I think we might benefit from being together. So um, just think about it. Okay, Mr. Dennehy, town administrator's report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, very quickly, um, along the lines of the green theme tonight, uh, I really want to thank uh, John Driscoll uh, Company for their pro bono work. Anybody that's been in uh, or around the library uh, or town hall in the last week or two, um, the mulch is down, the weeding has taken place, and the grass was actually cut yesterday. It's, it's a thing of beauty, and we need to thank um, Mr. Driscoll for his pro bono work to, to maintain uh, these two parcels of beautiful land in our town. So thank you to Mr. Driscoll and his, and his hardworking staff. Um, secondly, um, I was uh, contacted yesterday by the Department, Department of Environmental Protection. They're going to brief me tomorrow, uh, myself and some officials from Boston, regarding, regarding the Superfund project for the Lower Neponset River. So I should have, an, should have an update, if not next week, uh, the 28th on that. And the last tidbit is uh, received news um, late this afternoon uh, that the uh, FY22 House Ways and Means budget um, has been approved and we're gonna see the numbers uh, they're saying either tomorrow or um, by the end of the week. So, and I, they, they level funded the general government and local aid uh, and they increased um, chapter 70 and some other school School funding sources. So uh, we'll see what that nets out to, but uh, seems to be good news from the state house. So I want to thank um, Representative uh, Fluker Oakley and Representative Driscoll for their work on that. Thank you. Um, and I, I, uh, I did want to thank uh, Kathy Keyes. She stepped down from the Historical Commission and um, I know she'll be missed uh, by her fellow members, but she did say that she's, um, she looks forward to serving in the future. So uh, we can hopefully expect her back not too long. Um, and uh, I also wanted to thank Hillary. She helped with uh, uh, the Arbor Day Foundation, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the proclamation. I, I didn't quite have time to, to, uh, to get in there and, and update it. So she, she did that for us. I, are, do any members have reports, Ms. Conlon? No, I have no report tonight, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Doyle? Madam Chair, I would just like to thank uh, John Cannon and Steve Ivis for meeting with the Master Plan Implementation Committee for a comprehensive review of our wetland regulations as they pertain to the identification of possible sites for affordable housing in the town of Milton. It was an excellent session. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sulis? No report. Um, good evening, Mr. Freitag. It's nice to see you. Um, Town Council, Kevin Freitag's just joined us. 
And um, let's see, with your agenda items. Uh, thank you for suggesting putting public comment response up uh, at the top, uh, Mr. Zulis. I would hate for Mr. Johanning to have waited all this time looking at the hour. Um, so does anyone have community happenings? No. No, okay. I have no, I have no happenings whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> now you have a lot going on. Um, okay. Um, so at this time, I, I, in a moment, I'm going to make a motion to move into executive session. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, as uh, this matter predates my election to the select board, I am uh, recusing myself. Thank you, Mr. Doyle, and I hope the rest of your evening is uh, is a good one. So. Thank good you. Good night, Arthur. Thanks very much. Everybody, have a great, great evening. Thank you. Thanks for a good yeah. meeting. Thank you. Uh, I move to enter into executive uh, session pursuant to MGL 30A, uh, section 21, subsection A, subsection 1 to discuss an open meeting law complaint filed by Dr. Cindy Christensen and the select board's response to the complaint. May I have a second? Second. Do you want to add that we're going to adjourn from executive session and not return to open session? Yes, I do want to add that. So thank you. Um, so we, we will uh, adjourn from executive session, not to return to open session. Um, all those in favor, Mr. Zulis? Yes. Mr. Conlon and Mrs. Ms. Conlon, I'm sorry, yes. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I, need life. Go, I, I need to go to sleep. Sorry, everyone. That was um, Ms. Collins. Yes. Okay. I got myself right. Um, sorry. I woke up at two and I couldn't go back to sleep. Oh, gosh. Yeah. No, it's okay. I have nothing to complain about, but it does make the rest of the day a little fuzzy. Yeah. Okay, are we adjourned? Oh, yes. Thank we're, you. We're, we're, we're not adjourned.